And as for Hot Ticket 700 Sports, the buildup for this game was long. The talk was interesting, and the intensity was, well, intense. But after all the hype, it was finally time to play football. Utah versus BYU. This was maybe the biggest game in the history of this storied rivalry. Let's show you what happened tonight at Rice Eccles Stadium. Sellout crowd tonight, and most of them Utah fans trying to see if their team could go 11-0 and lock up a BCS bowl game. And check this out, the pitch to Savoy. He dances into the end zone. BYU trailing 7-0 on that Utah touchdown. But then Cougars get right back in it. Touchdown pass to Watkins, 7-7. Utah goes up again. Marty Johnson plows his way into the end zone. He will not be denied 14-7, but the Cougar defense was tough. Nate Solberg picks off the Alex Smith pass, and he heads off on a big return. Only Smith himself prevented the touchdown on that return. B would, BYU would get into the touchdown, into the end zone a little later. Curtis Brown scores. It's 14-14. We had a ball game. Later, Utes punting on fourth down. Or are they? The little fake punt run to perfection. The pitch to Bo Nagahee. He goes down around the left side, avoids some tacklers, picks up the first down, and that would lead to a touchdown. Alex Smith with a little TD run on a botch play. Nobody hand off to. Keeps it himself. 21-14 Utah. Second half, a big play for the Utah defense. They force the fumble after the reception, and our man Bo Nagahee is there. He scoops it up and goes 11 yards for the touchdown. 31-14, BYU not out of it yet, though. Beck hits Colley for the touchdown. Back of the end zone, Utah is stoked about this. Here's Colley's touchdown. Just gets his foot in the end zone. They count it, touchdown. Cougars down 10, and then they pick off an Alex Smith pass. You know, Smith had only thrown two interceptions all year long. He gave up two tonight to BYU, but Utah had the last laugh. The double pass by the Cougars is sniffed out and picked off by Eric Weddle inside the Utes five yard line. And on the very next play, look at this, the pitch to Savoy, gets to the sideline, avoids some tacklers and he is gone. 92 yards for the touchdown, that was the game breaker. Utah up 38-21, they went on to crush BYU at Rice Eccles Stadium, the final. Fifth ranked Utah, 52, BYU, 21. Utah, it looks like the Utes will be going to a BCS Bowl CLBCS. game. Cougars end their season with a record of five and six. Now both teams put their best players on the field tonight, and so did we. Let's go to our all-star team at the stadium, Marius Payton and Kent Roop. Gentlemen, can you describe the feeling at the stadium? It's a little bit different, obviously, for the BYU Cougars as they tried to finish on a winning note. And if they had won this game, they would have had a winning season. Unfortunately for BYU, it didn't turn out that way. They wrap up with a 5-6 and six record, and now their coach is in question. We'll talk more about that coming up. But uh, their coach, speaking of Coach Croton, very gracious in defeat tonight here at Rice Eccles Stadium. I'm proud of that team. I, I love them to death. I feel like they showed a lot of heart today. And I think they've got the makings of being a real good football team. They just keep developing, especially because so many sophomores and freshmen players, very few seniors on that team. So I think the future is very bright for, for our football team. We did all we could do. And I mean, that's all we, that's all the coaches ask of us is give 110%. We don't do, we don't make mistakes on purpose, but I mean, for next year, I mean, it just, it motivates us seeing this. I mean, you know, we got them at home next year and it's going to be great when we get to tear down our goalposts. I know how hard it is to put together a perfect season. And so far these guys have, um, I mean, we didn't want to come out the losers tonight. Um, we wanted to come out on top, but you know things just didn't work that way. And you know these guys played a pretty good ball game tonight. Utah's an excellent football team. Uh, their coaches did a great job of preparing them, and they played better tonight in every phase of the football game. And that's why the score was what it was. Uh, it could have been better. You know, always could be better. Um, they're a great team, and uh, you know we did, we just needed to step it up and. Uh, you know, we just didn't do that. The problem was for us that we didn't execute as well as we could have. And it's just, it's mistakes that we make uh, that determine the ball game. So, you know, they played well, well enough to win. We didn't make enough plays to win the game. My hope was that I could have given my players a better opportunity to compete to the highest level. I take full responsibility for them giving up 52 points. That's not who they are. They play well when they're prepared well, and that's my responsibility to get that done. Obviously, it's disappointing. And uh, you just want to take in this moment, fill it. You never want to get it again. And that's what you work for, and so that's what I'm doing right now, just taking it in. 
All right, Brady Papinga and the Cougars still trying to take it in. And, Mar, you have to wonder what these guys will be thinking about over the next couple of weeks and months. Their season's over. Utah has a bowl game to prepare for, but this BYU team had losing seasons in each of the last three years. I'll tell you what the Utah people are thinking about. They're thinking about sombreros and Tim P. Arizona going to the Fiesta Bowl, and they could very well get that bid. It looks like they have nailed down a BCS Bowl. The question is, which one? Now, the folks in Tempe, the Fiesta Bowl people, they really want Utah. But if a couple other teams start losing, Utah might wind up somewhere else, and we don't have the time to go through all of that. No, we it, don't. It does look like Tempe and the Fiesta Bowl right now. Well, we had uh, representatives from the Fiesta Bowl and the Sugar Bowl here tonight, so who knows where they might be. Any, any Orange Bowl people here? I haven't seen any oranges. <laughs> a lot of teams would have to lose. Oklahoma and yes, Auburn yes. and Cal and Texas, and that's probably not going to happen. Yep. Wesley, back to you. Hey, let me ask you guys something. You know, watching this game on TV, you kind of, even though it was close in the early going, you kind of got the feeling that, you know, you're just waiting for Utah to break out, and once they did, this thing was over, and which is exactly what happened. Did you guys have that same feeling there at the game, that it was just a matter of time? I was sitting next to Kent, and it, it was, yeah. I think, the early second quarter, I was like, Utah's about to break this thing open, and that's exactly what happened. Yeah, actually, it was the early third quarter after early that turnover. Quarter. Early third quarter, yep. and, and you did kind of get that feeling that Utah was positioning itself, that they were starting to wear BYU down. That offense is so potent, Wes, as you know. They score almost every time they have the football, and they did it tonight. They took care of business in that third quarter especially. You could actually feel the momentum switching oh, from BYU absolutely. right over to Utah. It was that big, Wesley. Hey, hey. Utah wraps up 11-0, Wes. I mean, we had seen it time and time again, and it happened here again tonight. And you guys look like you're relatively unscathed. How did you escape what was going on at the end of the game when the whole just entire crowd came down on the field and tore down the goalposts? I have two <laughs> words for you. Pandemonium. <laughs> it was crazy up in here. Kent, Kent was smart and he went to the outside. I'm <laughs> trying to go to the inside. Wrong thing to do. Stay to the outside and never leave your wingman, Mar. That's right. I never love wingman. leave your wingman. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, stick. And make up for last week's less than stellar effort to bring you the Utah Wyoming game. ABC4 has convinced both ESPN and the ABC Network to let us rebroadcast tonight's history-making game between the Running Utes and the BYU Cougars. So for those of you who don't have cable or otherwise missed tonight's epic showdown, or maybe you just want to see it again, here's another chance to see that great game. And for those of you who were upset over last week's telecast, or lack thereof, we once again offer our sincere apologies. Okay, everybody, sit back now, relax, and enjoy this once-in-a-lifetime Cougar Ute football game. Two. Pontiac presents ESPN 2's College Football Rivalry Weekend. There has never been a football day like this in the capital of Utah. From very early in the morning, when the sun came up, they were waiting. At 8.30 a.m. Mountain Time, college game day, and the fans were seen across the country. And then they hung out, tailgated through the snow showers, and now they're ready because one of the best players ever at Utah has a chance to take touchdowns. Now, Alex Smith, his name is on the Heisman list. And in the polls, Michigan, Miami, Florida, Florida State are behind Utah. Win tonight, and the goal is reached. This will be a forever team, the first true Cinderella at the BCS ball. But if the last step is the most perilous, it should be the neighbor that knows you best. The dislike is just as intense. BYU has done the little school they could dance two decades before. And tonight, the Cougars play for a winning season, a chance to go to a bowl, personal pride, and one everlasting title. The team that stopped the dream. Salt Lake City and for the University of Utah. Rivalry weekend presented by Pontiac continues with 10 0 Utah taking on their disliked neighbors from down south, the Cougars of BYU. With Michigan's loss earlier today in Columbus, the story's become very clear. If Utah wins here, they will be guaranteed a spot in the Bowl Championship Series, something that's never happened for one of college football's Cinderella's. And with that backdrop, we continue this rivalry weekend. Mike Tirico, Lee Corso, Kirk Herbstreit, Jill Harrington's down on the field amongst the snow flurries, and she'll join us here in a little bit. What a story Utah has been. This is history tonight. If they can win, we've never seen a team from outside of the top power leagues go to one of the big-time bowls. I know Louisville went to the Fiesta Bowl, but there were extenuating circumstances. This is truly historic stuff. The reason they're in position, a great offense, and Kirk, it's one that nobody's been able to solve. Well, they're so balanced and diversified. Of course, it's led by the quarterback, Alex. 
Alex Smith, but you look at Utah, one of only two offenses in all of college football to average over 230 yards running and throwing. And it's built around a quarterback in Alex Smith who not only has an ability to hurt you running and throwing, but he's very cerebral. They'll put a lot of a lot of this game plan on his shoulders and ask him to make checks at the line of scrimmage as he looks into the BYU defense. I think BYU has nothing to lose. They're going to attack him as much as possible, which will open up some one-on-one -on -one yeah. opportunities, maybe some big plays through the air for Alex. Now let's take a look at BYU and the offensive side. They're huge underdogs tonight. And you know what? What do they got to lose? I think they ought to come out smoking. They got a quarterback named John Beck that can throw the football over 2,300 yards passing this season. Then they got a running back named Curtis Brown, a sophomore. BYU is 3-1 and one when Brown gets 100 yards rushing. Now, if I was BYU, I'd come out and take some chances. I'd throw the ball around. I'd do exactly what Ohio State did today against Michigan. Keep them off balance. What do they got to lose? Go for it. Go for it. Go for it. BYU's <laughs> coach has his job on the line. Yeah. We don't know about the future of this program, but it would be nothing sweeter for them to knock Utah out of the dream spot. They're thinking Fiesta Bowl. They've got the sombreros before Fiesta or other parties. It's BYU. Kickoff next. between BYU and Utah, about 40 miles separating these two campuses, these teams who don't love each other. For more on tonight's game, to the sideline, a chilly Jill Arrington. We will go back to Jill momentarily. The temperature is in the 30s here tonight. We have the snow flurries that are falling now and the Wasatch Mountains around us are dusted with some snow. We had some snow flurries uh, right after and during college game day this morning on through the rest of the afternoon. Alex Smith has had an amazing season. 27 touchdowns, two interceptions. Now down to Jill. What's the intensity like down there, Jill? Well, it is unbelievable, as I was saying, the headlines today. Biggest game ever. And Utah gave out more media credentials for the national media in this game than they ever have for a BYU rivalry. And it was in last year's game that head coach Urban Meyer said he realized just how nasty this rivalry was. Now, he grew up in Ohio. He was a coach at Ohio State. He knows all about that Ohio State-Michigan rivalry. He said, but this one, you know, it's personal. There's so much at stake. It's not just the red versus the blue. And in fact, guys, I asked both coaches with all the unsportsmanlike conduct that's going on in the NBA with the South Carolina and Clemson game today, did they talk to these teams about how they should act today? And he says, both coaches, not these two teams. They will continue to play with class, Mike. All right, Jill, we'll keep an eye on that. Urban Meyer is the head coach at the University of Utah. Four years. Success with an offense everywhere. On the opposite side, Gary Croton of Brigham Young perhaps coaching his last game. Off we go from Salt Lake City. The toss won by Utah. They defer to half number two. So BYU gets it first. And the return by Bryce Moika. And the freshman out of Vancouver, Washington, brought down at the 22-yard line. So here comes John Beck. He's the starting quarterback, a sophomore. He's one of many married players on this BYU team. John Beck has had to really learn on the job, which is a very hard thing to do at the place where Robbie Bosco and Steve Young and Ty Detmer were quarterback. BYU quarterback is one of the prestige and pressure positions in Western collegiate football. He's had to learn on the job, and he's done a good job this year. Drive starts from the 23. Place rocking. Beck first down toss. A good one. Up to the 33-yard line is tight end Daniel Coates, a sophomore, picks up the gain of 10. Let me check the Bud Light backs and receivers for you. Lee told you about Curtis Brown. Todd Watkins, 48 catches. Austin Colley, 50 catches for the freshman. They can spread it out. The guys up front, they don't run for a bunch of yards. Willing Sanders, Lance Reynolds, whose father is the running back, running back coach. Scott Young and Jake Caressa, a sophomore up front. The best of the bunch is probably Young, who moved over from defense, and he's now a senior. Pick up of 10. First down, first run. Round into the line. will only gain a couple of yards. The calling card for Utah is its offense, and there's pushing and shoving as they remove the players from the pile, and everything comes out okay. The defense is strong. Marquez Ledbetter, Sione Boua, Fafita, Fanene come across the line. The linebackers, Spencer Toons, the top tackler. Hackenbrook is a senior, the biggest surprise, and Corey Dodds. In the secondary, the star is 25. Morgan Scowley just has a way to find the ball. 
always get his nose in there. You keep an eye on 25 in red tonight. He'll probably make a big play before the evening's done. Second and nine. Option to Brown. Only a couple of yards taken out of bounds by Spencer too. In light of what Jill says, you see the players getting off the Utah sideline cautiously. Jill talking to the coaches about the extracurriculars that we've seen, the disgusting thing in the NBA last night with what happened today, punts in South Carolina. I think it's good that we remind everyone here of how intense this rivalry is. It's not on the national scene, but every coach we talk to used the word hate. Not necessarily player to player, but certainly with the fans. So the combustible environment is <laughs> present tonight. Yep. They need to get to the 44 for a first down. Back. Pressured. Hit on escape. Steve Fafita. The nose guard out of California. Brings him down. You're going to see Utah use a variety of packages to try to get pressure on Beck tonight. This time they sat with man under pressure. They hesitated and brought a fifth guy. This is outstanding coverage downfield along with good quickness up front from this Utah front four. The coaches feel the difference with this defense from last year is the speed and determination of the front four of this Utah defense. The injured player is Brian Sanders, the guard who got his leg rolled up on. Fiita, Steve Fiita, the number 94, just used a bull rush. He ran right over the offensive guard. And the thing I like about Fiita, he's 311 pounds, but he's only six feet tall. You talk about low center of gravity. Boy, that guy put a great pass rush that time on Beck. Well, you get a good look, uh, Lee, at the injury to Sanders here. 78 as Fafita comes mm, in for the that's, sack. That's the... As an offensive lineman, that's your that's your worst nightmare. It, it, to be rolled up on, you just hope that uh, he's going to be able to get up from this. That is a, that's a that's a, a tough thing to see for Brian Sanders, especially first series of this game and a big rivalry game for the junior. Well, they continue to look at Sanders, so we'll step out for a moment. Brian Sanders was helped off the field, so Gary Croton will have to probably replace him at left guard. We have terrific kicker in Matt Payne who does it all, plays kicking and punting. He's a Ray Guy Award finalist, best punter in the country, and a Luke Groza Award semifinalist, the best place kicker. They use this odd spread formation on punts. Eric Weddle is back deep to receive. Beautiful 49-yard kick. And Weddle returns it up to the 27 yard line. Eric, uh, Matt Allen right on the tackle. Well, here comes Alex Smith. He came in with so much advanced placement credit from high school that he was able to get his economics degree in two years. What he's done on the football field is very equal to what he's done academically. He is an overachiever, he's a quick study, he's a fast learner, and his grade point average is extraordinary. We don't want to over junk you with stats, but here's as good as it gets. 27 touchdowns, two interceptions. Enough said. <laughs> First and 10 from the 26. Uh, a little trick right out of the gate. Throwback to Alex, who hauls it in. Barely does. And then finally gets beat up by a BYU defense that was ready for him. Daniel Marquardt with the tackle of the quarterback. Steve Savoy threw the pass. He is one of Three wide receivers with Travis Latondris and Paris Warren. Marty Johnson, a seventh-year performer, has had a good season. As for the men up front, it's Tupola, Dirk Mott, Boone, Kamoyatu. Chris is the best of the bunch, and he's next to Aalona, who's from right here in Salt Lake. Good job, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> lot, lot to get through still. <laughs> no gain for all the window dressing. It's second and ten. Smith to toss. Downfield for Latondris. Incomplete. The pass intended for one of 19 seniors on this Utah team. BYU plays a 3 3 5. Coach and Kirk will tell you what that's all about. But on the Bud Light lineup, here's Manaya Brown, Hila Payonga, and Sean Nua across the front. The best tackler is Cameron Jensen, the man in the middle. Brady Papinga will put the most pressure on the quarterback. These five DBs will be stretched and tested. Alba, Burbage, Francisco injured his knee against New Mexico, hasn't practiced much this week. He may get burnt a couple times. He's got to be careful. 
Burbage and Solberg round out that crew. Another good job, Mike. Thank you. Whew. Like to grade out well from the coach. Marty Johnson is spread out. Now slides next to his quarterback on third and ten. He's a pass protector, but Smith, unable to be sacked by Bauman, pulls away right at the sticks. He pushed the sticks away as he was shoved out of bounds by Maniah Brown. They're going to mark him short, and Utah's going to have to kick it away. Mike, you mentioned a 3 3 5 of Bronco Mendenhall, the defensive coordinator. It's based on disruption. He talked about effort. He said we grade on effort more than anything else with this defense. You know, four of his five defensive backs are either walk-ons or former walk-ons, and they're asked to stop Alex Smith and this offense tonight. It's going to take tremendous effort tonight by the Cougars to be able to do it. Kovakovic is the punter. He's an excellent punter as well. Matt kicks it away. Fair catch by Bryce Moika at the 24. We told you how intense this rivalry is. Let the people involved give you first person of what it's all about. I think this is a more personal rivalry than Ohio State Michigan because you're so close. It's not a national rivalry. It is a downright dirty nasty rivalry between two schools that are used to winning. It's like the state's just kind of split in half. You know there's the BYU fans and there's the Utah fans and whoever wins gets kind of take over the state for the rest of the year. This rivalry goes deep, goes really deep. You know, you're born either a youth fan or a BYU fan when you grow up in this community. I think it's something that sticks and it's something that everybody remembers what happens in this game because it's so huge. Um, I guess you can kind of call it the Super Bowl of the state of Utah. It is that kind of game. The pass intended for Chris Hale on first down is incomplete. You know, so often with the election, we talked about red states and blue states. Yes. Well, this is a red and blue state. Either the U for Utah or the Y for Brigham Young. It goes back a century. So many families are either all BYU, all Utah, and some have cross rival wires in there. Last year, that 3 0 game took BYU's 361 NCAA record streak and brought it to an end. After the incompletion, second and ten in the running background. Gains just two yards. We'll have third and eight coming up. The safety, Eric Weddle, came up to make the play. Well, BYU, if they cannot run the football tonight, it's going to be a long night. You know, they have 28 turnovers on the year. They're minus 11 in turnover margin. And now they're facing this Utah defense against a defense that thrives in creating the uh, turnovers. They might not be able to run the ball. Let me give you a stat. They're last in yeah. the Mountain West in rushing. Hello. Uh, that's not good. They need to get to the 34 for a first down. Against the three-man rush, Beck throws. Complete hot shot to Austin Colley. This is a terrific freshman, 51st catch of the year, and a first down for BYU. Nice offensive line protection by Reynolds, Young, and, and uh, up front and willing. They give the quarterback plenty of time, Kirk, but the play action holds the linebacker. That's why the play was good. Well, uh, the play action and the receiver, Brown, the running back, coming right out of the backfield and holding the linebackers at about five yards, and Beck puts it right into the window and actually anticipates that very well for a nice first down on third and long. Injured player coach for Utah, Sione Pua, was shaken up, and he's on one knee back behind the play. Kirk's point was well the quarterback faked the ball to Brown and when Brown went inside he took the linebacker underneath and they threw the ball right behind him. That was a beautifully designed play by the offensive coordinator Todd Bradford. Nice call. Nice execution. So the first down picked up by Beck. There you see his numbers. Very emotional was Beck after the loss last week to New Mexico. Gut wrenching seven point setback on senior day up in or down in Provo 21 14. First down he keeps it and he gets just a yard Spencer Tune, the weak side linebacker an academic all American with good speed like around a 4 5 40 came in to make the play. Hey Kirk is the have a special back back there. They're going to have to have some balance, but when you see them sprinkle in that, Mike, it's not something that they want to live and die on. Just enough to try to change up the defense to know that they can attack in different ways. Second and nine. They try to power run with Brown. Nah, -uh. nothing going on. Jonathan Finene made the play. He's one of those 19 seniors playing his final game here in Salt Lake City tonight. 
reason I, and I think Lee and I talked about this the reason it's so important to be able to establish something with the running game you don't have to live and die tonight by being able to run the football but just being able to pick up four or five yards from time to time and then go back to the shotgun and throw otherwise now you're going to face third down and long Utah's defense is going to pin their ears back they know exactly what you're going to do and it allows them to put as much pressure and be very unique with the ways they can come after you third and ten They bring five, pick it up long enough for Beck to throw, but nowhere for Todd Watkins to go. The ball came down. It's oh. still loose, out of bounds when nobody had possession. Now the side judge comes in and says incomplete. So the far side field judge, or line judge I should say, was thinking it was a fumble, but the side judge comes in to say it hit the ground. Incomplete and a punt. Now when you get into this punt formation, you said a unique situation. When I was coaching in 1959, Ben Schwartzwell, Walter, of your old Syracuse team, mm -hmm. was the first guy I've ever seen use this. And see three guys back there? They're responsible to keep everybody away from that kicker, but it's dangerous. I never did like this one. Able to do it there as Payne boots it out, taken on the run by Weddle with room to run. Oh, good field position here for Utah as the ball will come out to the 37 yard line. Special teams tackle for the second time by Matt Allen. Second drive for Alex Smith. Today, during the week, $500 per. And this is why. Utah started the season in the national rankings at 21 for the first time ever. We were here, guys, on Labor Day uh, weekend as they beat Texas A&M and all the way through no one within two touchdowns of the Utes this season. I think the North Carolina game also had all the people on the East Coast say wow it's a pretty good football team they beat North Carolina by 30 and they called off the dogs too. They They've were done that rolling up offense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They could have scored 70 that day if they won. That's a great point Kirk because you see the points given up a lot in the last four games starters have been out third quarter for a whole bunch of time. From the 38, Smith on the hand to Marty Johnson. Brings it out to the 45-yard line. I mentioned at the uh, lineups, this is his seventh year of eligibility. He was granted a two-year NCAA eligibility extension after 2002. Started in G. So he came back, rehab the next year, but was suspended for drunk driving. Urban Meyer thought Johnson was ready to come back, working on his alcohol-related problem. He's back on the team this year. Hit the throw, complete for a first down and more into the secondary to Steve Savoy. We say our first good evening to Matt Weiner in the studio. Hey, Mike, Taco Bell takes us to Iowa City where we're a champion in the Big Ten. Part of the crown share with their performance today. Uh, Marty Johnson run takes it to the 39 yard line. Of course, earlier today, Ohio State beat Michigan, hanging the first loss of the Wolverines. Wisconsin will lose back to back games. They'll be at 6 and 2 if that game stays the same. And Iowa at 7 and 1 will share the crown. But Michigan beat Iowa in the big house earlier this year. That's why the Wolverines will represent the conference. That gives the Hawkeyes a co Big Ten championship now, two of the last three years. And the job that Kirk Ferentz did this year with a, basically a fifth string tailback, Shuffled offensive line and breaking in a new quarterback in Drew Tate. And they're, going to, they're going to beautiful downtown Orlando. There they go. Back to New Year's Day. From the 39, the hands of Johnson, just a couple of yards out to the 38 yard line. We'll have third down coming up. We talked about the stats for Alex Smith. Here they are. Points responsible for means touchdowns, rushing, and passing. That pass efficiency is second only to Stefan LaFour's at Louisville and on through the rest of the eye popping numbers. I got one stat too. Good. 19 and 1 as a starter. That's the one I like the best. 19 and 1 as a starter. After 25 and 1 as a starter at Helix High School in San Diego. Third and six. Confusion in the BYU secondary. Now looks like they got it ironed out. Five in the pattern, in the middle. Here goes Savoy. Well, check it, it's Warren. Paris Warren to the 22. First down and a gain of 17. Of all the receivers, Perrin Warren has the most instinct to be able to settle in and find the open spot. I love the formations. They are mixing in a bunch of different formations. And you saw the confusion in Mike Tirico you just talked about. And how about that? The timing between Alex Smith and Paris Warren, they could complete passes in their sleep. <laughs> They're so comfortable and so familiar with one another. Here they go again with another empty set. 
by the Utah offense. Five more receivers to choose from. First and ten from the 21. Another throw incomplete. Sands won a flag, and here it comes. That'll be our first penalty of the night. Carl Richard is the official assigned by the Mountain West Conference. More on the quarterback to Jill Arrington. Well, it's amazing to look at those numbers and to think when Alex Smith first came here as a freshman, he was third on the depth chart. And Coach Meyer said he was third because we only had three quarterbacks. It's amazing how far he's come. Coach Meyer now says that he is the best quarterback in college football. There are other great ones, especially out here in the West Coast with Matt Leinart in yeah. Southern California and Aaron Rodgers at California. But Alex has been a great performer. I might agree with Urban Meyer when it comes to running and passing. I think he's the best yeah. all-around running and passing quarterback yeah. in the country. Sure. It's another five wide and empty. A lot of this all season, especially tonight, against this 3-3-5 BYU defense. Fake of the handoff. And Smith is brought down back at the 19 yard line. Matt Bauman, who was a walk on, who is a freshman but leaves BYU to go on his Church of Latter day Saints mission next year. We'll talk about the missions. Part of the story of BYU, church uh, operated and owned institution. Utah is the public institution. And those seeds help define the roots of this intense rivalry. Loss of four, second and 14. Smith pitching to Johnson. Out to the eight yard line. Fun looking play that is. Brady Papinga on the tackle. The penalty marker down on that play, and maybe it's going to come back. Brady Papinga says, I was held. And you are. Still, the play is one of the bread and butter of this spread offense. Uh, you're going to see Alex Smith from time to time go to this and they, they have a different uh, set of formations where they get to the triple option. They call this a five by one set between the pitch relationship right here underneath. You'll see Marty John uh, Marty Johnson to the outside and they're supposed to form an exact line. He's making the read here. If he comes out he'll pitch it under. In this case he stays to the inside. Alex Smith takes it up to the next level and makes the pitch off of Papinga. That's exactly the same play you used on college game day in a demo field. Yep. And I was the guy that got the pitch for a touchdown. Inside, for a touchdown. You almost turned well, an I ankle. Spiked it. You see it? You I did. Was, I, we, we were very worried about you as you made the You turn. went down LC. That's right. No I spiked it with two hands. I saw that. Kirk it's amazing. That's exactly what you showed us today on college game day demo field. Built by the Home Depot. Second and 24. The 29. I'll run with Clinton Ganther. First carry for the junior out of Richmond, California. And we go back for Matt Weiner. Another rivalry weekend update. A very disappointing Washington closing out the 0 7 season, 1 and 9 overall. Wazoo 2 and 5, and neither team going bowling this year. Third and 21, they can get a first down at the 5. Smith down the middle for left. Big hit, yard shy of the first down. Aaron Francisco laid him out. Let's see what Utah will do. Field goal and touchdown. Well, go for it. Boy, I really like the way that's Alex Smith steps forward. Watch this, Kirk. Fundamentally sound. Watch him. Shoo, boom. Latrondus. Whoa. Pass. Outstanding pass. Oh, and geez. the round here by Latondras, he gets it's covered right. to. Safety comes with him, but the ball is so perfectly thrown. It's the only place it could be for Latondras to be able to make the catch and then lower his shoulder to be able to take on the impact of the hit. And you'd have to be here to see what kind of. Yeah. Man, that was a flying shot right in there. Love the uh, pads popping out of there. As we said, they're just short. Going to go four, but Utah with a little confusion. Play clock running down will take its first time. Out. Is presented by Pontiac and the first ever G6, the next official performance machine of the NCAA. And in part by Michelob Ultra. Lose the cars, not the taste. Mike Tarico, Lee Corso, Kirk Herb Street, Jill Arrington, glad you're with us on Rivalry Weekend, presented by Pontiac. After the timeout, no change in strategy. Utah will still go for it on fourth and just about a yard. 
Play nine of the drive. Fourth and one. Five receivers. Smith, a design run. Right at the first down line at the five. Papinga made the play, and we'll check on the spot. Looks to be enough for the first down. BYU left their defensive backs isolated one-on-one. -on -one. They piled everybody else close to the line of scrimmage. They knew exactly what was coming with the empty set shotgun that Alex Smith was going to keep the ball. And one thing about this offense, I know that really was a good play there, and he made it by a half a yard, but I'm not so sure if they played Southern California and Oklahoma and these other teams that they could get in the goal line and not use some kind of a lead blocker. I'm not so sure you could throw the ball against those guys back there, Kirk. Phenomenal in the red zone this year, even though they don't have the power running game. Corner blitz from the bottom on first and five. They come right at Marty Johnson. The ball's out. And he fell back on it. So nearly a turnover. As Papinga, who's been very active in this game, and Sean Nua almost came up with a turnover. This is some of the dangers of running the option because Alex Smith is a quarterback. That mesh point between a, a back and a quarterback is very sensitive area. And Nua collapses down in a hurry and gets enough contact on the back to jar the ball loose and Utah's very lucky to get that ball back. Now the offensive coordinator Mike Sanford will say if that guy's taking that play fake it and come outside. Second and goal. Smith takes off. Takes it to the one. Well third in the yard coming up. Francisco who stopped the first down on the last third down helped stop a touchdown. You know the thing that surprises me about Smith, he's, he's a frail-looking 6'4 kid, but he's got a lot of quickness, Kirk. Watch him. He's right there, he's running away from those guys yep. from BYU. And that's the area that I, yeah. I think he's improved so yeah. much is his quickness and making quicker decisions to be able to take the ball and go. You know, we're talking so much about Alex Smith and about Utah. BYU's effort so far with an outman defense, they've given tremendous effort just to be able to get into these third and short, fourth and short situations. A seven-minute drive. Will it become a touchdown? Marty Johnson is stopped by this Cougar defense. Fourth and goal coming up. Bronco Mendenhall, the 39-year-old defensive coordinator. He said our defense is about disruption and, and, and intensity. Oh, <laughs> look at that oh, effort. I love that. Remember, before we leave Bronco Mendenhall, Mendenhall, remember one thing about him. He used to coach at New Mexico. New Mexico at... They held them, Broncos defense with style in New Mexico, held them to 28 points. Hmm. And go for How about it. this? Going for it on fourth and goal. What a momentum builder this would be for the hmm. Cougars. Smith to run option. Pitches to Savoy to the end zone. Touchdown, Utah. Second kicker used this year by the youths. David Caro, a freshman, hasn't missed any of his 32. Now 33 extra points. 13 plays, eight minutes. Savoy's fifth touchdown run of the season. Show us what happened, boys. Again, the empty set. This time, Savoy's going to come in motion to put himself into position, coming right here behind Alex Smith. Gutsy call here by Urban Meyer for fourth and goal. Decides to attack with Alex Smith, and at this point, he's making a pitch off of really an area, and, and also Aaron Francisco attacking Alex Smith and yes. taking himself out of position. Very good point, Kirk. And the one thing that surprised me, this kid, Savoy, is a wingback. That's his 20th run this year. I've never heard of wingbacks running 20 times in a season. 
they have a varied offense that really is tough to stop. Savoy, Warren, these guys, all that's what makes yeah. them so unique is they're going out for passes, but they also, a lot of times, are taking a pitch off of an option. You have Paris, to be very versatile yeah, this Paris, offense. Paris Warren has 24 carries. Yep. I mean, that is an amazing stat. 44 carries between the wingbacks. The uh, kickoff comes down to Bryce Moika, who takes it out to the 20 yard line. Tomorrow night, over on McGuire, Susie Colbert down in Houston, they'll bring it to you tomorrow night. And in that game, the quarterback for the Texans, David Carr, will be wearing a microphone. John Beck, home run toss on first down for Todd Watkins. In the air, deflected and almost intercepted by Morgan Scally. They have thrown so many deep balls this year in this BYU offense. First test tonight, handled by the corner and the safety. I'm going to give you a stat for this, Todd Watkins. He's caught touchdown passes of 68, 69, 70, and 79 yards. In fact, Sports Illustrated dubbed him the number one deep threat in college football. I don't know, I don't know if I believe that, right. but that's a nice thing. I, I like to call. He's, <laughs> he's 6'3", 190 pounds, and Utah's leaving their corners all by themselves out at an island. You have a quarterback that likes to throw the deep ball. All this momentum because of the crowd. Why not take a shot to try to slow this defense down? You saw Gerald Fletcher in the corner limp off. A second down play action pass. Beck off the run. He slides a lot. Does not slide there and gets seven yards to the 27. The book on the sophomore quarterback out of Mesa, Arizona is he's going to slide. And Kyle Whittingham's telling his defense, go right through him, guys. He's the defensive coordinator for the Utes. Whittingham brought that time a corner blitz from Ryan Smith from the freshman. You just saw him talking to Ryan Smith, who's right there next to the coach. And he tried to say, hey, time that blitz up better. Try to be able to anticipate the snap count. That way you can get in there and try to affect John Beck before he get pick up yardage by scrambling. Kyle Whittingham was one of the few coaches to retain from Coach McBride when he was here. He has a great reputation throughout the country as being one of the top defensive coordinators in all of college football. You oh. speak of Ron McBride, the former head coach yes. at Utah for a long time, who's now in his second year as the inside linebacker coach at Kentucky. And his defense thus far, guys, has held BYU to nine yards on seven carries. He's a tough-looking guy, right? He, he yeah. played for BYU, yep. and he played against me. Boy, was he a tough football player. Woo! I still remember him hitting my guy. Wow! They stopped the clock momentarily to sort something out, and now the quarter comes to an end. So we will have third and three when quarter two begins. Up 7 nothing after one. BYU coming up with just 38 yards on 12 plays. That long Utah drive, the definition of that first quarter, a 13-play, eight-minute drive, capped off by a fourth-down run by Steve Savoy. Quarter two begins with third and three, and a run by the quarterback, John Beck, who takes it across the 30, and will pick up the first down. Tommy Hackenbrook, the middle backer, made the tackle. Again, game. We will see win or lose if this is the final Gary Croton regular season game. A lot of conversation about that in these parts. No place to go on the first down run again for Curtis Brown. Sione Boa and Hackenbrook combine on the tackle. It's an offense and a defense that has dominated the first 30 minutes of football games this year. When you look at the points that they've allowed, it's close to a third of the total points that they've allowed all of this year. So you look at their scoring defense and it would be a lot better but they have their second and third units in usually by the time they get to the second half. No game second and ten. Beck looked deep it was covered just shovels one out to Curtis Brown who picks up a first down as he takes it out to the 44 yard line. He is a very inventive quarterback. We've seen him do that several times this year, a gain of 14. That's how I learned to shoot the two-handed jump, jump shot. Look. Look, that was an option pitch forward. How do you coach that one? Uh, you, you know, it's just, uh, you know who used to do that a lot at Boston College? Doug Flutie. Doug really? Flutie would just do, uh, it didn't matter if he started to scramble and run for his life, he would just throw it forward, just flip it. And, yeah. uh, you know, it, it gets the ball there as yeah. quick as you can. And, Picked up another first down. BYU maybe trying to gain a little momentum here. 
first in ten. Spencer Tune out for a play here. Play action by Beck. Another long ball shot for Austin Collie. Holds it in. Out of bounds at the 14. Big gain to the freshman from El Dorado Hills, California. 43 on the pickup. It's a nice job of the offensive line protecting and giving Beck time, but it's also a great job by Kali of getting off of man pressure from Nagahi. He ran away from him and it made it easy for Beck to throw it there. Well, Kali comes down, he gets away. That was a good call on you. It was man for man coverage, and but the pass was laid perfectly in the hands of Kali. Austin Kali, 6'1, 185 freshman. The good player. A really good play. Double tight ends in Utah Power or BYU Power set. Play action on first down. Waiting for somebody to come free. Beck directing. A flag comes down as he goes down back at the 25. The flags are in the secondary. The sack was by Jonathan Fenene. Number 90. All right, Mike. Here you go. You got it. You ready? I got it. Boa. 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 He Boa was holding them. Number 90. He tried to slip that tight end out in there, but Bohua grabbed him. <laughs> beautiful, <it. you're> beautiful. <laughs> Bohua was perfectly holding that tight end. I hope you show that again. Sioni is from uh, oh. East High School right here in Salt Lake City. 6'3", 330 pounds playing pass defense. It's hard to hide when you hold downfield like that. Minded his own business going on a simple little he thought, he thought he's wide open. Didn't he? <laughs> so it's first and goal from the eight. It's been a long time since BYU scored a touchdown in this rivalry. And they try to get it to Todd Watkins, and the pass is incomplete. Chucks on the outside. Two field goals in 2002. No points in 2003. Can they end the drought against their rival? Curtis Brown takes it into the boundary to the five yard line. Jonathan Fenene over there for the play. We'll have third and goal coming up. A couple of minutes. Go to Dennis Pittett. Pittett is probably the more athletic of the two. He's number 88 off to the left-hand side as a wing back. Brown is the lone running back. He's there to block for Beck. He throws to the back of the end zone. Inbounds and caught. Touchdown for Todd Watkins. Give them a reason to believe. We've seen it all day today. Big underdogs in rivalry games. Give them a reason to believe. And it's amazing what can happen to a team's psyche as they try to build confidence into this football game. That was a big drive for the Cougars. Matt Payne, their outstanding kicker, on to add the extra point. They've waited a long time. I mean, November of 2002 is a long time for BYU fans. Wow. To score a touchdown against their rival. Feels good. Right? Two field goals in 02, nothing in 03. Watkins not only has them on the board on the back end of an 80 yard drive, this game's tied at seven. Well, BYU got the matchup that they wanted and it was an isolation between their receiver their best receiver Watkins going up against a corner of Utah and this is something that they try to do when they get inside the red zone young just takes the inside move Antonio young and look how open Watkins is Watkins and, and Kali give BYU a real chance tonight against these Utah corners because of their size and speed what I liked about Watkins that time is he's presence knowing where he was on the field he didn't catch that ball out of bounds. He just had just enough to put one foot in it. That was a really good play, Mike, of knowing where you are on the football field. Yep. That receiver, Collie, had a 40-yard catch, a big play on that drive. Deep kickoff to Justin Walker. Averaging 30 yards a kickoff return. He will take it out with blockers across midfield and to the 41-yard line. What a return for the young man out of Los Angeles, California. A return 60 penalty marker down at about the 42 yard line of Utah. So it will come back a bit. Oh, it's against BYU. Interesting to see a dead ball foul called 20 yards behind where the play stopped. 
but it will go even farther into Cougar territory. Well, this play's going to open up. Look at, the, look at the wedge that he has and the wall blockers that he has, and he follows them right down the left-hand side. It really wasn't anything fancy. They set up a wall to the middle. Nobody came to pick them up, and the wall continued down the left-hand side. They're lucky that that didn't go all the way, but they're going to... Looks like, Mike, they're going to actually get it on Utah. Well, right? the official just said he pointed in the wrong direction. He meant to point back okay. the other way, so it'll bring it back to the 45-yard line of the Utes. Nonetheless, a great return by Walker. That would have been the first time we've ever seen a kickoff return where the coverage team got a penalty. It's always the return team, right? <laughs> it's pretty much. It's a slam dunk. It's a holding call. Right? Yeah, every time. Right? I'm blocking in the back. Yep. That's my favorite. John Clark, the tight end, is one of the five receivers out wide. Quinton Ganther is now the back. The throw to Savoy was deflected, caught, but a loss of four. Let's go check it on Oregon, Oregon State postseason implications, Matt Weiner. That's right, Mike, the annual Civil War. Oregon State wins at home. They go bowling. That, used, that is called the Civil War. This has been referred to even by people on local TV today and throughout the weekend as the Holy War. Given the climate in our country, we're going to refrain from using that nickname for this rivalry here tonight. Second and 13. A handoff to Ganther, and Quinton takes it to the 46-yard line. Well, ESPN.com has game day live every Saturday, and Jim Donnan is the man at the keyboard, and he is with us here in Utah. Coach, let's go down to the sideline, visit with you. What have you seen so far from this Utah offense, Jim? Well, it's as good as anyone I've seen all year. Uh, the really tremendous diversity, ability to run the option to throw the ball. It's a coach's dream, and Alex Smith is the real deal. Well, Jim is online, ESPN.com, a running diary from down there, his observations, answering your questions about the game. The former head coach at Marshall in Georgia. I'm um, Barry Switzer, staff at Oklahoma, one of the great minds of the game. Great to have him here. Here, Alex Smith is pressured, rolls out, will run for the first down, out of bounds at the Cougar 41. He is the second leading rusher on this team, 13 yards added to his total there. Continue to talk about how he can hurt you with his arm, but also that's not just speed, that's strength to be able to pull out of that. Last year, Alex Smith, I don't know if he's able to pull out of that tackle. This year he is, and then the speed to the corner to pick up the first down. At number 36, Markel Zufari was trying to catch him from behind. He had no, no chance for no I tell you what, the more I see of Smith, the more I'm impressed with his quickness for 6'4", 212. Five carries, 25 yards on the night. Decides to throw here. Pump and down the middle to Paris Warren. Good spin at the 20. Down to the 11-yard line. 30 on the game. Nate Solberg tackled him. This is where the Utah offense exploits a defense. A scramble from the quarterback, a run. All of a sudden, you, you start to get lulled to sleep because they, they, they can attack you in so many different ways, and then they get the one-on-one -on -one matchup with a safety against their best receiver. Francisco is a great player, but there's no way he's going to stay with Paris Warren all by himself. I like there. the way Paris Warren catches the ball, all the receivers, with their hands, and then turn immediately into ball carriers. I like that a lot. Utah trying to respond to the BYU touchdown on the prior drive. Winton Ganther tried to bounce it outside. Had to get away from the first five. He's brought down, but a penalty marker comes down. That reaction from the crowd. <laughs> Face mask. Is it yes, five sir. or 15? Super size. Nope, sorry, Daniel Marquardt, coming your way. Personal foul. Face mask. Defense number 36. Half the distance to the goal from the previous spot. By rule, automatic first down. And Kel Stafari, the flag. Rice Eccles Stadium in Salt Lake has been sold out throughout the season. What a tough ticket to get here tonight. Temperatures in the 30s, it's cool. This rivalry that's been decided by no more than seven points in the last eight years is all tied here. Utah trying to retake the lead. They win, they'll be in the BCS Bowl. Now 
Chris Warren came back to hand off to Marty Johnson. Powering forward to the goal line. And in. Touchdown. First thing Alex Smith or Urban Meyer wants to talk about is how great this offensive line is. Everybody wants to talk about the skill players like on any offense. This offensive line just took the BYU front six and pushed them back into the end zone. And Marty Johnson kept his feet moving into the end zone. And Marty Johnson named, but took Cameron Jensen, number 35, right with him and put him on his back in the end zone. That's a strong run of that, sweetheart. David Parra with the extra point. I don't know if Marty Johnson's a wrestling fan. That was the best pile driver I've seen all year. 14-7, Utes. University of Utah, undefeated, number six in the country, number six in the bowl championship series, Paul. A long kickoff return, set up that five-play, 55-yard drive. Again, just to reiterate, with Michigan, number seven in the BCS, losing today at Ohio State. It is hard to fathom a scenario where anybody can come up and get Utah. So they'll finish in the top six. That means an automatic invitation to one of the four BCS games. Short kickoff. Returnable by Moika. Comes back shy of the 20 yard line. Well, back in history, 2001. This BYU team in the season Gary Croton took over for Lavelle Edwards had to go to Hawaii to try to complete a season. Shadow and set an NCAA record. 342 yards of kick return. Nick Rolovich, the quarterback, threw eight touchdown passes. BYU fumbled nine times. Hawaii won 72 to 45. Remember Luke Staley suffered a broken leg. The top rusher in the country was not there for that game. That was an undefeated BYU team trying to knock on the BCS door and be the first team from outside the top six leagues to get to the bowl championship series. A Beck run gains a couple. Boa on the tackle. So BYU in 2001 was added to this list since the BCS started of the teams that have come close to running the table. Tulane and Marshall did, but didn't have high profile enough seasons to get up inside the top six. Then Hawaii lost, ending up uh, outside of the BCS top rankings. And Boise on that same path again this year. But Utah at number six, win tonight, they're going to get in. Beck incomplete behind Brown. Let's go back and check what's going on in Washington with Matt Weiner. Wazoo winning in the Palouse. Matt and Rod Gilmore join you all the scores and highlights at halftime. Keeping an eye on Florida, Florida State, scoreless in the first on ESPN. Here, third and eight. Little pressure from the Utes. Beck hangs in there. Good haul in by Watkins. The junior receiver brings. Tell you what it was. The wideout did covered up the tight end. Yes. Covered up Dennis Pitt of the tight end. Exactly. So now to get to the 29, Beck needs a big shot downfield. Does dumps it underneath. His running back Brown will be banged down to the 23 by Boua, who has been pretty active. And the BYU will kick it away. Starting to get that feeling a little bit, you know. It's yep. starting to start get. Yep. <laughs> this will be a very, very big series for the BYU defense. Alex Smith starting to heat up. Utah offense starting to figure things yeah. out from the BYU defense st standpoint. It's be a big series. And that's why that was a big penalty because that was a first down for BYU. They still have the football. That came to kick. Line drive, 45 yards. On the run, taken by Weddle, who brings it across midfield and to the 49. What a huge night for the Mountain West Conference, and their commissioner is with Jill Arrington. That's right, Mike. I'm here with Mr. Craig Thompson, the commissioner of the Mountain West Conference. Now, if Utah wins, they get a bid to the BCS Bowl. Um, 
tell me, does that prove that the system works or do you think that it still means that the system needs adjustments? Well, Joe, a lot of people are working very hard to change the system. The commissioners, the president, since February, we're modeling the fifth bowl right now. I think a lot of people are putting a lot of effort into changing the BCS system. And if Utah does get that bowl bid, there's a $15 million payout. What happens to that money? Will it be split amongst the conference or teams in your conference? We have a revenue sharing formula. Obviously, uh, Utah is a participant. We get a lot more than anybody else, but we have a, a factor in place. Tell me now, do you want Utah to win this game? Well, it's interesting. There's a whole lot of football left in this one. These schools can't even decide how long the series has been going. There's such a hatred. So it's going to be a fun one. Congratulations. Your teams are doing great this year in your conference. Mike, back to you. Thank you, Jill. Alex Smith with the run there. What Craig was talking about, uh, this series, if you listen to the folks from Utah, is in its 86th playing. BYU says the first six didn't count because it was Brigham Young Academy, not Brigham Young University at that point. So they can't even decide how long it's been going. We can say it's over a century. Utah's won most of the games. Uh, they had a great run at the very start of the series. As nasty as this rivalry is, it's been pretty clean so far. Mm -hmm. Pretty clean. Only a couple of personal fans. Yeah, it's, all, it's not bad on, on this day. <laughs> it's true. Second and five. Put Tom Ganther into the secondary onto the 27-yard line. And Kirk, to amplify what you were saying, you really get the sense of building momentum after that three and out and the Utah offense is humming 18 on that snap and it, this Mike this is kind of what Utah has done all year they, they, they have a way of feeling things out and then they start to really make their moves and the adjustments and I think Quinton he not only has power like Marty Johnson he's got a different gear and great acceleration up through the hole along with that toughness that he runs with. Harris Warren comes in motion. And Alex Smith looked his way, but is brought down. John Denny, whose brother plays for the Buffalo Bills, the senior went to Rick's Junior College, comes up to make a play. BYU is number two in the league in sacks, and that was a really good call there by Bronco. Mendenhall. What he did is he fought a halfway blitz on one side, but the other side, one on one, Kirk. I like this defensive coordinator, Mendenhall, because I think he keeps everybody off balance. See him? Yep. They're coming with, right there, one man coming. They look like a blitz one way, but in a way. Nice to walk through that double team, too. It's yeah. Dirk Martin Boone, the Garden Center fan. Smith's throw, Paris Warren got some of the yardage back and out of bounds. We'll mark him at the 23. We'll have third. And seven coming up with six left here in the quarter. Last year, Paris Warden carried most of the load for this offense. One of the biggest differences is this year, he's still a great player and a great leader, but there have been other players that have been able to step up and take some of the pressure off of him. Savoy, Savoy, uh, Latondris, Madsen, the running game. It's been a much different attack this year now, not only with the, the, uh, the personnel around Warren, but also with a quarterback who now has a much better understanding on how to run this offense and Alex Smith. Warren has three catches, 57 yards. Jerome right in the game as Latondris is banged up. The high throw over the head of Warren is incomplete. So we'll have a 40-yard field goal attempt coming up. But first, here's Jim. Mike, I've got some injuries to report for Utah. Travis Latondras, their wide receiver, he is out of the game with a bad shoulder. Now, Morgan Scally on free safety, he has been having major migraines during the game. They have taken him out, and they're not sure if he's going to be able to return. He has a history with migraine problems. And also, Gerald Fletcher, you saw him come out with that knee. He's still questionable to return. Well, that's a uh, big loss for them. Joe, they're going to go here again on fourth down. Fourth and seven. From here, the field goal will be 40 yards. Interesting, guys. Picked up two fourth downs earlier in the game. Those were fourth and shorts. Alex Smith for the fourth down conversion. It was red and intercepted. Nate Solberg down the sideline. Smith has an angle. And pulled him down at the 24. What a momentum change as the junior from West Valley City, Utah, comes up with a huge interception. Just the third of the year thrown by Smith. I go back to earlier this week when we talked to Bronco Mendenhall and he had so much respect not only for Alex but for the way how disciplined Utah's offense is. He said hey guys on third and seven they're going to run around to eight yards on third and four they're going to run around to five yards here fourth down and about seven look at that. 
He ran a route right one yard past the first down. That is outstanding scouting, uh, scouting by BYU, being well prepared, and a player listening to what a coach says and jumping in an opportunity to make an interception. BYU serious about hanging around tonight. They got to make them pay. Curtis Brown hits it hard. He's inside the 10. First and goal of the seven, a pickup of 17. Antonio Young, who's in because of the migraines Jill told us about with Morgan Scally. Young was the man who had to save the touchdown there. Left side, Willing and Vincent made good blocks on this because they stayed with their block. Notice how they stayed with their blocks, Mike. Really good block in that time, especially on Willing, the left tackle. He kept with that man to the outside, poof, to the inside. Big receivers, Watkins is 6'3", Holly is 6'1". First and goal from the seven. Oh, right, right up the middle. Brown bounces it to the outside. Tying touchdown for the Cougars. Exactly the same play. Isn't it amazing what an interception yeah. can do to a complexion of a football game? We were just talking about Utah going in for a big, big touchdown. Not only the momentum, but maybe the knockout punch early, and all of a sudden an interception. And look at the BYU offense. Now they want to start running the football and establishing things, being physical up front. The kicker, Caro, is a freshman for Utah. He hasn't attempted a field goal over 40 yards. And he has a leg to make it from 40. He made a 36-yarder easily against San Diego State earlier this year. But the choice to avoid the 40-yard field goal attempt leads to the interception and two runs by Curtis Brown, the sophomore from California. All square and 14 in Utah. McDonald's and BASF. We don't make a lot of the products you buy. We make a lot of the products you buy better. Three touchdown underdog BYU is square of the game. 540 left. The touchdown run by Curtis Brown out of Palmdale, California. He had a mild concussion in last week's game against New Mexico thus preventing another 100 yard performance from him last week. John Madsen comes back to take this kickoff and he's knocked down at the 20 yard line by Quinn Gooch. Lee takes us back to what happened. Let's give the right left guard and right left tackle some love right there is a guy named Gary McGibbon. I misspoke. Watch him. He's the right tackle on a depth chart but he comes in when the left guard is hurt. That was a perfect block by him and Kirk you got to give Jeff Grimes the offensive line coach a lot of credit. He came back with the second call. Nice blocking, wasn't it? Boy, they, they, they just oh. took control up front on those two plays. And again, I think it was all set up off the interception, the momentum that they had on the sideline. Yeah. You could see them running out of the field. They were ready to take, yeah. take control of this thing. You see Utah, best in the nation in turnover margin on the opposite side of it here tonight. First down run from Marty Johnson, who takes it out to the 29, a game of eight. On ESPN, it's Florida, Florida State. Hey, Matt Weiner has an eye on that one. Hi, Mike and the Gators have broken the seal in Tallahassee. Pause. Miami would stand to gain in the BCS world if they can jump Florida State when all is said and done in a three-way tie in the ACC. Miami would represent the league as the conference champion. All right, with Ganther for a first down, or right at the line, out to the 31. If Virginia Tech still controls its own destiny in the ACC. We saw them, and plenty of them, Thursday night as they dominated Maryland. If Virginia Tech wins out of Virginia next week and then down at the Orange Bowl in two weeks, they go representing the ACC. But if Florida State loses here, they drop BCS in three-way time. Miami could get ahead of Florida State and represent the league. Virginia Tech almost beat Maryland as bad as Miami beat Wake Forest today. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> they got to be very Looks careful. Looks like the Canes are waking up. They got to be very careful with that rivalry game with Virginia looking ahead yeah. to the Miami game. Oh, Virginia, very, Virginia Tech next week. Yes. Nope. Very, very careful. First and 10. Smith back to the air. Throws the strike out to John Manson, or rather, Ganther, the running back, who brings it to the 48 yard line. On Ganther was just a safety valve. Boy, did he make something happen to that one? A safety valve who was waiting and waiting <laughs> and waiting. And I thought Alex Smith kind of laid him out, but uh, you can watch the hesitation here. Alex Smith is looking downfield. He wants to go downfield. Then by the time he decides to throw it out, I thought he's just going to throw it away. There's so many white jerseys over there, but 
Get, look at this. Two or three white jerseys. Ganther cuts back, and he's able to avoid three guys and pick up a nice game. And Madsen stood there and watched. He couldn't pick up any <laughs> of the white shirts. Blitz coming. Picked up long enough for the throw. Hauled in by Paris Warren. Inbounds, and now stepping out. At the 44, gain of nine. Both second and one ahead. Boy, they well, put a, I'm telling you, they put a lot of back as the game goes on. A couple minutes delayed, but it'll be good. Really interesting. It'll really be good stuff. Sunday Night Football on ESPN tomorrow, 8.30 Eastern, game time after NFL primetime. Isn't it good to have Mike Patrick back oh. at that at heart surgery? Wonderful. Well, what I a like great human well. being. Second and one. Ganther dashed him up the middle and got to the 36-yard line. Game of 10 yards. Utah going right back to their offense. Mike Sanford, the offense coordinator, told me this week that he said, you know, the most important thing to our offense besides the versatility and all the things that we try to do is balance on first and ten. We really work, even throughout the game, of trying to uh, prepare our offense and trying to mix in the run with the throw on first and ten to try to slow that defense down. See the receivers communicating to each other. As they're out there, a lot of reading goes on by the players. BYU defense read the carry by Johnson very well. We haven't really dove into it, guys, with the way the game's gone. 3-3-5 three, three, defense. Mm -hmm. Is it the defense that can best match up with these new spread offenses? It might be because you have the skill yep. in the back end and the five defensive backs. It's really a six-man front the way they use their linebackers. They blitz them a lot of times. The key word that Bronco Mendenhall said to us, disruption. They want to confuse the offensive line and the quarterback because the five defensive backs are right across the way. They're not set up in your conventional secondary shell. Intercepted and dropped. Is it a fumble or an incompletion? Oh, they call an incompletion. Aaron Francisco had it. And then lost it. Smith almost in back-to-back -back possessions had as many picks as he had all year. Well, we just talked about confusion. And what they do is, as the quarterback looks into a defense, typically just based on the way the defense is lined up, he can tell. Look at the five defensive backs. They're in a straight line. And then as soon as the ball is snapped, then they're going to go and move into their formation. A lot of times they play man, and other times they'll play robber in different schemes. That time... He was right there. Francisco was right there to make the interception. And they're disguising coverage well. The reason why that defense is so good against the spread offense is one word, flexibility. Yep. Third down now. They need to get to the 26. Smith is pressured, put one up for grabs, and threw it away as he was rushed by Manaya Brown. Uh, Manaya Brown, who became oh. a father back this summer, Working through injury all year, and let's see what uh, Utah will do. They've gone for it three times on fourth down. We're out of field goal range, you would think, here from 52 yards away. Lee, you said flexibility. Yes. I think that's an important key because when you have five defensive backs, mm -hmm. a lot of them are hybrid, almost like a safety linebacker combination. They can blitz. They can cover. There are so many different things they can do. But it's you, as a quarterback, you look at them, and you don't know which way they're going to go based on the position that they play. Bakovic back to punt. Always beware of a fake down here. And that's why BYU stays in its base defense. And here is a fake. Kovakovic on the pitch. Picking up blocks. Enough for the first down. Oh, Nagahi. So they stay in the base defense. But the punting wrinkle works. Oh, absolutely no excuse for BYU's defense allowing this to happen. Oh, no way. You sit there and you watch him and you what? And you say, Mike. Beware of the fake. Thank you. So one thing you have to be aware of, oh. but, I, but I, I'd just like to say this. All day we talked about the pressure on Utah and how are they going to handle the pressure. They've gone for it on fourth down now twice, a fake punt. They're throwing back to the quarterback. They're playing to win. Sometimes teams get into these positions, uncharted waters. They, they get tight and they try to avoid losing. Urban Meyer tonight is playing to win and not just to avoid losing. When you coach aggressively in games like this, it helps your players not be tight. Yep. Players feed off of that from a coach. See if they bang the momentum home. First and ten from the 13. After the run by the safety Nagahi on the fake punt. The pitch to Paris Warren. Nice cutback. 
Gets him down to the foul. Matt Ayu, sophomore made the tackle. Again, there's the versatility of a wing back. Sometimes you're going to find a wing back that has to go out for a go out for a pass. Other times, he's going to pitch off a of Papinga. Now you've got to catch the pitch, get up field, and be physical. Lower your shoulder, make a move, get into the open field, and that's what makes this offense so good. Is the way they use guys like Paris Warren, not only catching passes but also running the football. When Tom Ganther moved around by Smith, Savoy in motion, Ganther on the handoff. Trying to get the first down there at the two. I want you guys to mark it down. That fake punt and the call and the execution might take that man right there to the Fiesta Bowl. Mm -hmm. And that's big. That's so big because if they can get this touchdown and go in with momentum, aha, they're going to come out smoking. Mm. We've got a measurement coming up. You know, all of us are talking about B or about Utah and going to the BCS and man, wouldn't this be great? And if they win, they're going to the BCS. And today I had the Fiesta Bowl jacket on. Nice we're all excited. Put, had the Your sombrero hat, and throwing the chips around. It was a nice look for you. All of a sudden, I looked down at the bottom of the set and I saw a guy in a navy jacket with a sugar bowl uh, sign on it. Sneaking I around the Salt Lake Cup. I thought it was. It's kind of interesting that yeah. they, I wonder why they're here. They're not here for BYU, are they? No, nope. no, no, they're not. No. They're here if BYU <laughs> beats them. Nobody. They go nowhere. They're, saying, they're only saying. here because the guy wanted to come out skiing. Okay. All right. I'm just saying. Just keep the door open down the I'm just saying knowledge. it's not a slam dunk for Festival. Yeah. Might want to maybe a Sugar Bowl bid also could be on the line. One of the non Rose Bowl or Orange Bowl games. First and goal. Smith takes it and takes it in for the touchdown. I don't know if it was confusion it was play. or deception, but it worked. Put it in the playbook. This is a busted play that goes for a touchdown. He's trying to find out the guy to fake it to. Watch, Kirk. Who am I going to fake it to? Where's the guy? No way. Nice. All, right. All right. Put it in, coach. What a coach. Huh? <laughs> busted play touchdown. The freshman from Bountiful High School playing his sixth game. David Carroll bangs through the extra point. So Smith threw an interception on the last drive. Almost threw an interception on this drive. But the fake punch leads to a 12th place, 79 yard go ahead score. What a great team here in Salt Lake City, a city that has hosted big events in the past. The NBA Finals when the Utah Jazz were eliminated by Michael Jordan and the Bulls back to back years in six games. Of course the 2002 Olympics 1979 the greatest NCAA championship game in uh, collegiate basketball the Magic and Larry game was right across the street at the Huntsman Center. Never had a football game this big Utah trying to get to the BCS. They're on top by seven. Here comes a Moeke kick return. The freshman with room to run. Rice from the week is best pickoff return of the night. Out to the 33 yard line. Here's your Yamaha game track tonight for the first time in 122 attempts. Interception thrown by Alex Smith. It led two plays later to a Curtis Brown seven yard touchdown run. But Utah fakes the punt. The pitch to Bo Nagahi, the senior on senior night from right here in Salt Lake City. After 12 plays, 79 yard drive along. Off by Alex Smith in the touchdown run to make it 21 to 14. First and 10 for John Beck in the BYU offense from the 33. Five yard gain over to Todd Watkins. Clock continues to run inside of a minute. Nope. Uh, stop the clock here as BYU will take a timeout. Back here in Salt Lake City after the timeout. Second and four for Beck. A throw complete to Jason Kukahiko. Takes it to the 41 yard line. Let's visit with Matt Weiner quick to look ahead at halftime. Moments ahead from the Pontiac Kai Performance Halftime Report on the way. A disgraceful display in the South Carolina Clemson game in this day full of rivalries, one that overshadowed Lou Holtz's final game. BCS jockeying and a Rose Bowl berth that's perhaps a little less sweet for Michigan. Join. Rodney Gilmore and I at the half. See you then, Matt. Here's the pass on first down. 
It is incomplete in and out of the hands of the tight end Dennis Pitta who's had a tough first half. He was the one involved ineligibly down the field. And the drop there. What Matt was talking about the guys detail at halftime with Iowa beating Wisconsin and the Badgers losing back to back games here at the end of the season. Michigan will go to the Rose Bowl. We'll likely see Iowa New Year's Day in Orlando the Capital One Bowl. And Wisconsin should end up. Where would they end up? Laying Cal. I mean, uh, the Orange Rose Bowl have Cal. Here's the pass. Ooh. Is it a catch and a fumble? No, it's incomplete. Incomplete pass. Wisconsin probably end up in the Outback Bowl. Yeah. yeah. Probably get in the Outback Third in the Big Ten. Maybe right. playing a Georgia team. Marquez Ledbetter made the hit here. It's third and ten coming up. Do we have a catch and a fumble? Full possession and a step as Ledbetter came busting in. 38 seconds. Cougars have to get to the 31 to keep this drive going. Out of the Lance Reynolds snap. Beck throws incomplete. Coming out of his break, the tight end lost a little bit of his footing and couldn't get out there. So on fourth down from the 41, what will Gary Croton do? We got to go for it again. Can't punt it. We'll take a timeout and talk about it. Okay. The 47-year-old <laughs> BYU coach, who was a student assistant for Lavelle Edwards back in 1982, took over for the Hall of Famer, who won 257 games. Well, the football weekend, as always, extends to Monday night and starts with Monday night countdown presented by UPS at 730 Eastern. Stewart. And you just have to execute. Yeah. I mean, the matchups you want, top of the screen, Watkins, bottom of the screen, Collie, both these guys can get open. Comes a corner blitz at the bottom. Fourth and ten. Oh. Almost intercepted by the corner who was sitting there, you know Ryan yep. Smith. <laughs> you know what he did? They've yeah, shown the, the corner blitz so much. This is a great call mm -hmm. by Kyle Winningham, the defensive coordinator. They have shown the corner blitz on third down and long. Look at him. He's just starting to inch forward. He goes forward and then comes back. He's given the look, shows Beck, I'm coming. Beck thinks, oh. and you can see it. As soon as he released the ball, he wished he had a string on it to bring it back to his hands to be able to throw no, it away. You know, I told you he should have punted it. <laughs> Let's see if Urban Meyer wants to att get into attack here, get into field goal range. He's got plenty of time with this offense. Absolutely. They've gone for it four times on fourth down. This is an attack team. Jerome Wright, one of the five receivers in the game. Smith is flushed. Looking to throw it downfield. And he falls down back at the 38-yard line. Essentially a sack, but a sack does not stop the clock in college football. So I think this play will uh, take us to the end of the first half. All right, I like to call it because Gary Croton told his BYU team. We're here to win. Look, we're going to here to win. That's right. We're a 21 point underdog. Let's go for it. I like that. 21 14 at the half. BYU hanging in there. Has played pretty well so far. Gary Croton having a word for the official before he heads out. And heads over to our Jill Arrington. Jill? Well, Coach, you've been able to hang in there with Utah's explosive offense. How important is it for you to continue to play aggressive here in the second half? Well, that's why we went for it on fourth down. We're playing to win. They're a good football team, and they're going to score. We've got to match their scores. All right, Coach, thank you. you Mike? Jill, thank you. His defense will be on the field first. Utah gets it first. 30 minutes away. From history, trying to become the first non big league team to make it to the bowl championship series, leading by seven to Matt Weiner in the studio. YU with a victory over the Cougars, it'll be Utah guaranteed spot in the bowl championship series by all possible calculations. Guys, we'll get to the second half. How does BYU stay in it? How does Utah pull away and clinch it up? Continually coach Gary Croton to win the game. That's very important. Not to keep it close. Go for it, BYU. I think BYU has to avoid self-destructing. They did such a good job of that in the first half. Remember coming into this game, one of the worst teams in the country with the turnover margin. They have to continue to give John Beck a chance. Utah with a win would hand BYU its third consecutive losing season. That hasn't happened for BYU in 40 years. Matt Payne's kickoff begins the third quarter. Taken by Steve Savoy. The starting receiver takes it across the 20. 
and to the 22. Here's Jim. Well, in talking to Urban Meyer after halftime, he told me they will continue to play aggressive and go for it when needed on fourth down. That's the style of play that they play. They continue it because this is the game. They've got to let everything out because it all counts tonight, guys. Jill, the offense went three and out of that first possession, started clicking three touchdowns in the next four, but the one where they didn't score was the interception that became a two play touchdown drive for the Cougars. So Alex Smith. Back to work. First down pass hauled in by Harris Warren, who takes it to the 29-yard line. How about the night for the junior from La Mesa, California? Well, I, I think as far as Alex Smith and his standard, it was a, a good average first half. He's made some plays, but I want to give BYU's defense a lot of credit for forcing Alex Smith to be patient. They jumped him there on a fourth and seven call. They made some plays. They're not allowing Alex Smith to find rhythm back there, and they're also not allowing him to hit the big play. They're keeping everything in front of those five defensive backs in the back end. The two top running backs, Marty Johnson and Quinton Gather, in the lineup together, and this is Gather up the middle. Can he take it all the way? No, he's pulled down at the 15. A huge gain of 55. The offensive line was really tremendous right there, particularly the center, Jesse Boone. Now, Jesse Boone's block allowed Ganther to go all that far, my friend. Yep. Boy, was that a good-looking block. I think great blocking up front. And, and then also the, the uh, perimeter, the receivers did a nice job on the defensive backs, opening things up downfield. And again, Paris Warren, kind of the complete guy leading the way that time for Ganther downfield. They call that form formation pony. They put their two best backs in the backfield. Looked like the old Pony Express on that one. Johnson. Spins into a tackle. They get a one. John Denny made the tackle. Here are the Pontiac stats from the first half. You see Utah with more yardage in that one turnover. The only turnover of the game turned into the Cougars' second touchdown. The knock on any spread offense is that when they get into the red zone, they're not tough. They're not tough enough to execute. They have to be fi a finesse offense, and sometimes that works. But when it comes down to really rolling up your sleeves and being physical and being tough up front, sometimes you can't do it. Utah has proven this year you can do that with this kind of offense. Warren came in motion. He's the option pitch man. Shovel the money, Johnson. Inside the 10 and to the 7. So the receiver becomes the option pitch back and the shovel pass forward to the running back. Again, it is if, if you've watched Air Force and Fisher to Barry, then you know that this is the kind of offense where you're going to find and it's the same same principle, but it's just different formation. He's reading, he's pitching, and he's just getting the ball to the running back in a different way and reading the def defensive end. If the defensive end takes the quarterback, he pitches it underneath to the back. That's the type of they call the Utah pass. Lee Gross Cup yep. and Jack Curtis, like 150 years ago, invented that play right here in Salt Lake City. Lee Gross Cup, the All-American, 1957. Timeout taken by Utah. It's first here with two and a half gone by. What the quarterback is going to try to do is he wants to read the defensive end. This time, they actually, they're blocking his read. The, the guard came out to block his read. If this, this man will come out and take Alex Smith, which he does, look at that open up for Marty Johnson. The pulling guard is supposed to go around and stay off of the read for the quarterback. If let's if the read were to come down, then the quarterback would take it up to the next level. Again, it's the same principle as Fisher to Berry's wishbone attack, triple option attack. It's just run out of the shotgun. So you're telling me the offensive lineman's there, the defensive guy's there, but don't block him? Yes. That's right. So let it's, him go. Let him go. Yeah. That, that's, okay. that's the quarterback's key. You, you, you don't want to you don't want to block him and take that. The quarterback's read will take that player out of this play completely. Your job is to go up to the next level and block the linebacker or safety, whoever happens to, happens to be scraping. And if he would have done that, <laughs> right now there'd be a touchdown up on the board for Utah. And the way to stop that play, if you can, is to bring a free safety or a strong safety up to the inside and make the tackle. That's how BYU stopped that play. The, t the safety came up. Yep. Boom. Now, the reason why he was up there so close, they don't have any depth to defend. That's why that play sometimes doesn't work as well on the goal line as it does in the middle of the field. This is third and two 
First down awaits the five, seven yards away from a two touchdown lead. Smith runs for it, and BYU is there to stop it. Cameron Jensen, the leading tackler, joins Manaya Brown, the defensive end, and this time on fourth down, a field goal attempt comes up. Great job by Bronco Mendenhall and his defense. Looked like they were ready to give up a touchdown. They held tight down inside that 10 yard line and again going back to that scouting report empty set third and short you know it's going to be Alex Smith running the football missing a player out there for Utah the deep snapper wasn't there now Whoa. David Carroll's deep snapper shows up for this 25 yard field goal that will become a 30 yard field goal I'm pretty sure it was the deep snapper. oh yeah it was a center yeah. that's one you don't see very often. Usually he's the first guy on the first guy. Yeah, out well, involved. he was expecting him to go on fourth yeah, down. Yeah, yeah, he goes all hey, night. He's Coach. done. Now you know what? That's not a bad penalty though, because what it does is it opens up the percentages of making this because it opens up the angle of the kick. From the left hash from 30 yards, Carroll knocks it through, and the happiest snapper in the world walks off. <laughs> <laughs> with the rest of the Utah team and a 10 point advantage. Brady Parker is that deep snapper. 24 14 our score. Utah on top by 10. Notice and still there and see all the teams New Mexico Carolina Colorado State Wyoming and, uh, and the, um, well, where's the where's BYU. Oh the team down south. Of course, with Provo being 40 miles south of Salt Lake City. And if you uh, live in Michigan and Ohio yeah. country, yeah. you understand that. If you don't, Jill will tell us right after this kickoff. Bryce Moika with the kick return from the four. He takes it out to the 20 yard line. We go downstairs to find out about down south. Jim? That's right. Well, it's a bitter rivalry. And in talking about this rivalry, Coach Meyer refers to BYU only as the team down south. And you're right. He got that from Woody Hayes, who used to talk about that bitter rivalry as the team up north. He would never even say the name Michigan. He just said that team up north. That's where he got it. And now it's the team down south. Bitter rivalries. That's what happens, guys. Well, that's where Urban got his start. He is a Midwestern guy born in Ashtabula, Ohio. That's along Lake Erie, just over the Pennsylvania border. At about 60 miles east of Cleveland he got his start there and of course went back to the state of Ohio for his first head coaching job at Bowling Green on first down John Beck slid and fell on this turf and he's down to the 10 yard line more on that down south team up north thing in a second first Matt Weiner in the studio hi Mike for pride only in the Palouse as neither team will go bowling this season John Beck's night. His school, BYU, is picked up on the Team Down South reference. They now start calling Utah a team up north in their media releases here this week. Second and 19. Here he is from the middle. Big hit. That's a fumble. My ball. A scoop. A touchdown for Bo Nagahe. Receiver and Nagahi, who had the big punt return earlier, or the fake punt, I should say, run, comes up with the touchdown. The officials having a conversation now. Now for the best celebration flag. He's confirmed a touchdown. And they just wanted to make sure there was, in fact, a catch and a fumble. And they ruled that one. Carroll on for the extra point. And now they can really smell it. Here in Salt Lake. Ten points in 60 seconds. On senior night. The senior from Skyline High School here in Salt Lake City. On the biggest night in Utah football history. Off the Tommy Hackenbrook hit. 
Bo Nagahi scoops and scores. Utah's up 17. All right, everyone, if you're just tuning in, this is a special rebroadcast. Well, the BCS has never been crashed by anybody outside of the big leagues. Utah could be well on its way. This is a great play by middle linebacker Tommy Hackenbrook coming up. Nothing pushing him deep. He times this up perfectly. The ball's, the ball's behind. The ball's behind Harris, but Hackenbrook timed it up perfectly to jar it loose and come up with a big turnover. The Big Ten of the NFL, I don't know if that would have been called a catch. I don't know if he had complete control of that like ball. Because it was behind him, there's a little bit of juggling yeah. there. Out of bounds, it'll take over at the 35-yard line. Well, back in 2000, for those of you who think this one might be over, remember it was the final game for Lavelle Edwards as the BYU head coach, Ron McBride, with the greeting there. Darnell Arshadel, the quarterback, 20-yarder to Matt Nickel. Utah led the two minutes left. BYU blew a 16-point lead, but Brandon Nolan, the four-yard game-winning touchdown run, and Lavelle Edwards was carried off by his players. Victorious here in Salt Lake City. Our Pontiac flashback takes us back to one of the great meetings between these two teams. The hole is big, the opponent's bigger tonight. That whole drive started when the quarterback back on the first snap for BYU slipped and fell on the moist field turf. The first down run for Curtis Brown out to the 47 yard line. Hey, before we get away from what we were talking about, the team down south, the team up north, the added to this rivalry back off Michigan Ohio State is Brown with 45 yards tonight guys give me your thoughts on what happened in Columbus that really affects this game with Ohio State beating Michigan today it does affect uh, Utah and their BCS uh, hopes on lock now if they can win just want to congratulate Jim Trestle and uh, his team they uh, had their backs against the wall there have been a lot of distractions on the outside they came together and played a, a terrific game a perfect game and that's what they needed to do in order to beat Michigan from the 47 Beck play action He's going for the home run ball. Foul ball. <laughs> Incomplete <laughs> intended for Kali. Morgan Scally. The uh, migraines in the first half. The seniors back on the field here in the second half. Coach, what do you think about Michigan Ohio State? Troy Smith. What Teddy, a, Teddy Ginn. What a quarterback Troy, Troy Smith. Troy I mean, well. Now, Teddy Ginn made it some great plays on a punt return, especially and a catch. But Troy Smith, they must have made 300 yards yeah, I think running had, and passing. I think he had over 380 yards of total offense. And, and, that, and that guy ran and passed like he had a full heart to beat Michigan by himself. That was a tremendous performance by Troy Smith. And Jim Tressel, 3-1. Congratulations to the guys down south from Ann Arbor. Here the team down south trying to pick it up a little bit. Eric Weddle with the hit on Curtis Brown and late penalty flags come in. And again, why that game implicates this one. Who knows how the computers and the people involved vote? We figure that it's out. It's so hard to forecast and <laughs> figure out. That much we, yes. we know. But we do know this. The team behind Utah at seven, Michigan losing. The team behind them, Florida State, is down 10 0 with four minutes left on ESPN as Florida is playing a good game down in Tallahassee. That means as Utah win, if it happens tonight, be almost no way they could be jumped by the other teams in the bowl championship series standings. It's going to be interesting, too, to see who ends up number two, obviously, and going to the Orange Bowl. If it is in Auburn, the Sugar Bowl would lose their representative. The Sugar Bowl would select after the Rose Bowl to find out who they would take. If you lose your anchor tenant, then you pick. Pac-10, Rose Bowl, SEC, Sugar Bowl. Beck trying to make this a game still. Swings it to Brown. Some room to run. <laughs> big, big hit down at the 23. Everybody's okay? Down to Matt in the studio for an update. There's the story there, Matt. There's LSU plays Arkansas on Friday over in Little Rock to wrap up its season. Ole Miss still has the finale in Oxford against Mississippi State. Curtis Brown running well in this half. And guys, there's been room to run for Brown here in the third quarter. Morgan Scally made the hit there. How about the hit in the last play? Let's go back and listen to it. One of those kind of games. Ooh, you get a chance to lower stuff. the boom, you're going to do it. 
Brown's not backing down. Mike, you're right. He's getting his yards here in the offensive line from BYU. Ever since that touchdown after the interception, they've been able to do a little bit better running the football here. Fahu Tahi is now the back. Tahi tries to move. He's more of a big pounded forward back as opposed to a slasher and a darter. And his first down run gains three. Tahi has run for 338 yards on this season. Utah, one of those defenses that loves to try to outnumber you up front. If you're going to try to run the football, they feel you're going to have to earn it because if you, they're going to have eight, sometimes nine guys up there if you de are determined to try to power it in there. Watkins, bottom of the screen. On the fake to him. They look for Austin Collie in the back of the end zone. Terrific catch. Inbounds. Touchdown. Oh. What a grab. You're applauding. Absolutely. That was a heck of a play. Uh, that was a great football play at his foot. Austin Collie. Wow. 16-yard score. And there's the matchups that they want. Look at him stretch oh. and then watch the foot. Nice oh, catch. Beautiful. Yes. Remember, Todd Absolutely Watkins perfect. did that same exact thing of knowing where he was on the oh. field on the other touchdown. Oh, the great news is he's a freshman. The bad news from a football standpoint for BYU fans, he's going to go on his Church of LDS Mormon mission, be gone for the next couple of years. But boy, if he comes back, what a sweet player he is. Touchdown eight of the season. Oh. A great response by the Cougars. Ten point game again. Good morning, everybody. We hope you're enjoying this special replay of history. In a must score situation, the freshman Austin Collie able to get the touchdown grab. A 16 yarder to make it 31 21. Kane's kickoff tumbles down to Steve Simone. He returns it out to the 26 yard line, stood up by Dustin Gabriel. No whistles, no flags, no problems there. Well, our Yamaha game track started with game day's first ever Mountain West Conference appearance and Herb Street in one of his memorable moments. Of course, so he's you're rubbing off on him sitting next to him. Nagahi, the fumble recovery, 12 yards here to start this quarter, and BYU with the responding drive. And the great 16 yard call in by Collie. 31 21, halfway through the third. He's learning we're in the entertainment business. Oh, is that is? That That's what, what he's, he's got to learn. <laughs> nice jacket, hat. Head. It's a script now. <laughs> it's not just a headgear. The last segment has become a script. First and 10 from the 26. Alex Smith, incomplete, intended for Paris Warren, who was double covered. You want to go back to that again? I. I oh, we're going to listen to? Uh, let's see what happened on game day earlier today. What you got there, Kirk? I need my hat. What you got there, Kirk? I got the, uh, the John Junker Fiesta Bowl hat. <laughs> no. Watch this, folks. Fiesta Bowl Tostitos Fiesta Bowl. I think I got Chris Fowler here. Watch the back toss. Chips. Get ready. Make your reservations. <laughs> You're going to Tempe. That's me. Boom. Oh. Wow. Fowler <laughs> beat you up. I drilled him. Oh, man. Uh, Second and ten, the pitch, the sh shovel to Paris Warren, who gets it out to the 28-yard line. They did a great job here in Salt Lake City. You know, one thing, when schools have the infrastructure to do big-time things on a regular basis, it's a lot easier. What a story it was here <laughs> today, as everybody in the Utah Athletic Department pitched in. In this stadium last night were three state high school championship games. It was a wonderful scene around this campus the last 24 hours. And our hats off to uh, Dr. Chris Hill and the rest of the athletic department here at the University of Utah for hosting a wonderful weekend. Hooker defense, can he rise up on third and seven? Pressure coming. Hey, he got to Smith, but he got in the way to Warren. And he got the first down at the 37 yard line. Boy, do they understand football. First down, let's go back to Matt Weiner in our studio. All right, Mike, looks more and more like the Apple Cup is going to go Pullman's way. All right, let's call that one done, huh? 28-10 yep. <laughs> is a game It's been a of long year for yeah. Washington. They need to restart quickly. That's a game of little interest. Smith first down, hitting the faces. He threw an incomplete. What a shot he took. He was just ready to release. 
Sean Newell came in and hit a break Ooh. under the chase. Well, college basketball is underway. Feast week continuing on ESPN2. Monday Night Doubleheader, J.J. Reddick, number 12 Duke, taking on the Wildcats of Davidson. And North Carolina lost to Santa Clara on their way out to Hawaii, where the Cougars will be waiting in the EA Sports Maui Invitational. You see number three in the ESPN USA Today coaches poll. Carolina knocked off last night in Oakland. This BYU team coming off a 21 and 9 year. And they've lost their big man, Rafael Araujo, who went on to the NBA. Feast Week, College Hoops, Monday, ESPN 2. Second down, and Marty Johnson runs for a couple of yards. Do we just put a top five college, college hoops? hoops? Mm -hmm. You know the good thing and the bad thing about college hoops, top 25? Irrelevant. Yes. Nobody cares. But the good thing is, it is irrelevant when you get to March. And it's decided on the floor. Right. That's and exciting. Syracuse and Connecticut have proven the last two yeah. years winning yeah. the national champions. Yeah. That's right. Point that out. Third and nine. A third down pickup by the Utes on the last drive. There's Paris Warren to the right there to tackle. Picked up the pressure this time. And the throw is picked up. It's Spencer White. They have an angle on him. Right to the five. Flag is down. Back in the secondary. Is it on the return? It looks to be. It's the exact same situation when Nate Solberg made his, his interception. The referee's mic is not working. It's an illegal chop block on BYU, but possession will stay with the Cougars. Smith, two interceptions all year, two interceptions in the last two quarters. Well, third and eight, you know that if you're in man coverage, Savoy, Warren, any of these guys, they got away with a little bit of holding the jersey. Oh, <laughs> my gosh. But you know they're going to run the nine-yard nine round. Nine they, that's how Solberg made his, his interception on fourth down, and it was about nine. This time, White does it, and he sits there. He got away with a, a pull, and that's – whether it was a good call or bad call, yeah. it's irrelevant. That's going to happen. He made the play, and he was sitting right where he needed to be to come up with a pick. And the penalty is because you're blocked below the waist after that interception, and you can't do that in any play in college football except inside the line. Massive opportunity for BYU to throw to Collie, who's going to throw downfield. And this one is intercepted by Utah. Eric Weddle comes up with the pick. BYU had walked right down the field on the last drive. They went razzle-dazzle, and Utah's Kyle Whittingham, good defensive patience, they were not fooled. Come up with the pick. Uh, it's easy to be critical of a receiver trying to throw the pass, but he waited too long. He waited too long and gave Weddle enough time to come over. By the time he set his feet, then he put the ball way up in the air. The safety had plenty of time to come over. They had Utah fooled if Colley would have been ready to throw and threw it a little bit more, with a little bit more, instead of the loft, put it a little bit more on a, on a, uh, on a rope. But I do like the call going for the shot after the turnover. That's a good call. Weddle's fourth interception of the year. First down, back on the field. The option toss to Savoy. Savoy, a touchdown run earlier, has the sideline. Steve Savoy's passed the ball. How about this for a momentum swing? Hey. Touchdown, Utah. 92 yards. The sixth rushing touchdown on the season for Savoy. The extra point makes it 38 21. Officially 92 yards. It is the second longest run in the history of Utah football. Frank Nelson, 1947, had the longest one. That one was against BYU. 68. Kamoy up to watch him come out here, the big guy, and make the play right there to make the block. Now, Kirk. 
Watch him down the side, and that was really interesting how he kept his feet inside, didn't he? He sure did. I thought I liked how he set yeah. up the blocks. Came way on to the, the rest of the offensive line. By the way, Paris Warren's jogging and he's staying with Savoy. <laughs> I, I really like the way he said, look, he moves to the inside, gets big, back to the outside, gets behind those big linemen. At this point, I thought he was going to just run out of bounds or get pushed out of bounds, but he was able to stay in bounds, and then he had the speed and got some blocks all the way down the sideline for a touchdown. This whole story of in the state of Utah, and you're either a U or a Y. Steve Savoy is from Dunbar High School in Washington, D.C. Basketball hotbed. And he comes up with perhaps the biggest touchdown run in the history of Utah football. Listen to this place. It's jumping now. 38 21. If you haven't seen Utah play a whole lot this year, that was a great example of why this team is so superb. The offense gets credit for the 92 yard touchdown. It was the defense that came up with the interception to get, get to the football back. Well, we got taken down at the 17 yard line down to the sideline in jail. Well to put this importance of this rivalry in perspective let's look back at 1942 a telegram was sent to BYU's head coach Floyd Millett from a soldier fighting in World War II saying you know the only thing more important than this war is beating Utah. That was Vaughn Kimball a former BYU player who sent that telegram. And that ended up being Jill the first football team from BYU to beat Utah. Deck back to work. Brown runs for a couple. This defense is kind of juiced right now. Huh? Spencer two with the tackle. We'll take you back to 62 years ago. You saw the telegram. There it is in the Deseret News. It's still published out here. BYU snapped a 20 game win the streak. First ever win against the Utes. They went on to lose the next 16 straight games. Long history of this rivalry. Kyle Whittingham has played in it as a Cougar. Now coaches as a Ute. The defensive coordinator for Utah dials up a little pressure on Beck. Underneath it's caught. Room to run for Watkins. 36 yard line. I think Bo Nagy is having a pretty good final game in Utah's uniform tonight, huh? Gain of 17. Nagy, he's got a chance to get out there and play even more tonight because of Gerald Fletcher has uh, been taken out of the game with an injury. He's going to step up. I mean, it's a, it's a good play. It's a first down for BYU. They find a pocket there, but Nagy, for a little guy, 5'10, about 185 pounds, steps up and makes a big stick and that's the way you do it for the young guys at home there's the technique you want to emulate you know be the safety and go for the mindless kill shot and miss the guy it's down run by Curtis Brown across the 40 out to the 42 pick up a five so it's so rare to see a nice form tackle we should show it like 20 times it doesn't make yeah. sports center highlights the big the big hits do but form tackle when you actually wrap up and use your arms it's a thing of beauty most impressive thing about it was it's in the open field too yeah. I mean usually those kind of tackles don't come about except for the linebackers and yeah. coach you know what the beauty is with 85 and scholarship members the coaches say we can't afford to get anyone hurt we can't practice yeah, tackling the hours are too short and then the NFL coaches say nobody from the college game comes as a good tackler anymore second and five here is Brown to run through the tackle of Eric Weddle that time. LC, take me back to the practice field and show me the good tackling. Well, you know why he didn't make this good tackle? Watch him break down. What they call breakdown means you get yourself square and he drops his butt. You get the butt lower than his shoulders and then you explode right straight through it. Ooh, that was nice. That's like the old days. Yeah, good stuff. I know you guys think this is crazy, but I think you're in four down territory now. <laughs> you ain't got no choice. <laughs> Third and one. They stack the line. Brown powers through. He has run really well tonight, guys. They haven't had the home run hitter back in the backfield like they had when Luke Staley led the nation in rushing Gary Croton's first season, but he's given him 400 yard games this season. He's had a good one tonight. Four straight, Mike. Mm -hmm. Four straight, 100 yard. Remember, 
we, in the opening part, we told, showed him that he has three and one record BYU does when he gets over 100 yards. He's a key. First down for John Beck in the offense. Use that run to set up a deep ball threat. Almost circled under by Powell. Conley's one of the more instinctive freshman receivers that I've seen in a long time. He just looks like, you know, a gym rat that plays football. He just le always seems to be able to try to adjust to the ball and come over to make the play. But Scully, the veteran, the safety, is he at least able to slow him down and prevent him from getting over to make the catch. Scully almost bit initially on the on the uh, handoff, but he got back in time. I love Conley is it. Conley's a gamer. He really is. Second and ten from the middle of Rice Echo Stadium. Another pounding run by Curtis Brown with a third and about a yard coming up. Jill Arrington can add on the safety who made the play on the last snap. You guys see Morgan Scully. He's been out here for the whole second half after suffering incredible migraines in the first half. At one point, he was in tears. So he's such a competitor. He's the captain of this team. You know it means a lot for him to be out here as a senior in this big rivalry game. But he's tough. He's back. He's feeling better. Well, he's tough. He was a rugby player, a national-level rugby player at Highland High School. They won the national championship and went down to represent the U.S. in Zimbabwe. And they beat Tonga in the third-place game when they did it. Fahu Tahi is stopped on third and one and we'll have fourth down coming up. So with it fourth and a couple Croton the former Chicago Bears offensive coordinator sends three receivers out and the jumbo package of two tight ends in the back come out. So they go spread here on fourth and two. Linebacker two oh, that's pass, pass interfered Absolutely. on the running back Curtis Brown. He just completely tackled the running back as he tried to turn it up field. First down, BYU. I thought Kyle Whittingham, the defensive coordinator, was gonna tackle Toon <laughs> after he made that mistake. <laughs> Look at he's gonna he's you just keep in the rule book, Mike. You have it there in your blueberry. You can pull that out. Blackberry, blackberry, Kirk. Pull. blueberry, blackberry. Blue, blueberry were your pancakes blue, and cracker yeah. pounds. That was good go. stuff. <laughs> look, look at look look the coach. Up. And then here comes Urban <laughs> Meyerman for the tag team. I tell you what, he was a tough football player when yeah, he played for BYU. Let me tell you something. Look at him. As if announcing the numbers wasn't enough, then he got the head coach of the defensive coordinator over there oh. for the tackle. They're still having conversation about. What the call was? They call it a penalty. Holding. With that yardage, first down. Well, he tackled it. He the, the ball was in the air. It wasn't pass interference. It was holding. He just wrapped him up and took him five yards out of bounds. Hey, look, he's got him wrapped up. It's and not he, hard. For by the way, then he's going to drive him. He's lucky he didn't get a personal foul. On top of that, not hard for the official to call a flag <laughs> when the head coach and the defensive coordinator oh, are just... yelling at their player. What are you doing? <laughs> it kind of makes it an easy call. Kyle will be a head coach at some point, I would guess. He's 45 years old. We mentioned retained from Ron McBride. So while everything is new and hot here in Utah, this is the same defense that they've been running with alterations in scheme for many years. A timeout being taken here as a flag comes down as well. The Utah sideline wanted a timeout. The referee threw his flag. And let's sort it out. Again, the microphone's not working. Oh, it is now. There is no foul for illegal substitution by BYU. Utah had called timeout prior to the break in the huddle. Timeout Utah, their second charge team timeout this half. So instead of a penalty on BYU, it's a Utah timeout. They only have one remaining. You've seen the intensity tonight. We've talked about the ties that bind these people, these places. Jill told you about Morgan Scally with the ear, or the tear-producing migraines in the first half. Let Scally tell you 
about the impact of this game, especially being a local guy. It means the world, uh, especially a local guy. Being uh, born and raised in Salt Lake City, it, uh, it's, it's what you dream of. It's what you grew up and uh, if you're playing football, that's, that's the ultimate goal is to, to play the big dance and to get that national respect. So it, it would mean the world and it's, it, uh, especially here in Utah, it you know, it means history. That's why the rivalry is enhanced tonight for a local guy to be part of, as we said at the beginning, a forever team in this state, in this conference, and in the nation. There they are at six. Michigan has lost. Those of you who've tuned over from uh, the first half, Florida, Florida State at halftime with the Seminoles trailing by seven. If seven and eight go down, nobody's going to catch them. Right. Even with a Michigan win today, I th they're going to head. They would have head headed to the Rose Bowl as uh, the representative for the Big Ten. Turns out they're still going to go with Iowa taking care of Wisconsin. Utah is in. They're going to if they win this football game, they're going to go to either Sugar, either the Sugar Bowl or the Fiesta Bowl. After the timeout, the flag. It's first and ten for Beck. The corner route is covered well. Is it in bounds for the pick? No, out of bounds, incomplete. Nearly another interception by Ryan Smith, a freshman out of Diamond Bar in California. Very, very close. It happens so fast. We have the luxury of watching this in slow mo, maybe from three or four different angles. It was just a matter. It was just a matter of did he have possession of the football yes. because his feet were in. And that official, I never complain about an official that made a call like that if he was in that good a position. He was in perfect position to see that better than anybody else on the field. And in case you couldn't tell, they just showed it on the replay screen. Three times. Five times on first down, Beck has gone deep. They come back to the run on second down and lose four yards as Sione Boua made the tackle. A little pushing there, some words exchanged with Fafita. Everything's okay. So let's check with Matt Weiner one more time. Hi, Mike. Can we check? Wow. Oregon State looks like they will get to six and five, and looks like it will close with three consecutive losses for Oregon and no postseason. Oregon's given up 62 points the last two games. Their defense collapsed. So close to beating Cal, the drop pass on fourth down to get in field goal range two weeks ago to go from that to no bowl. This is third and ten. In four down territory, the back brown stuck his left foot in the ground, cut right. Some keep moving. Hey. Both Bo stand right here. <coughs> Nagahi makes the tackle. Nagahi didn't hit. this time. He used his arms, his legs, everything that he could to bring down Curtis Brown in the open field. Remember last time we showed you? Perfect form. <laughs> this time he went with the WWE wrestling move. Rugby. Rugby. That, that's a rugby. Is that a rugby? <laughs> yeah, that's a it, rugby leg. The other guy's the rugby player. Scotland? That's okay. Is that, that the rugby Scott? player? No, the well, that's no. okay. He played rugby anyhow, this other guy. <laughs> well, four All fingers right. in the air as we head to the final quarter with good reason. Utah is 15 minutes away from college football history. One of the little guys playing with the big guys. Up 17. We have fourth down coming up when we come back to Salt Lake. Reaches quarter number four. Off we go to the fourth with Jill Arrington, Lee Corso, Kirk Herbstreit, Mike Tirico. At 38-21, a 17-point game. You would need a field goal somewhere in the comeback. So the big, strong-legged Matt Payne will come on. Had an NCAA record of consecutive 40-plus yard field goals made. Stopped last week from 46. Bangs it. No good. So he's missed his last four field goals and Gary Croton understanding the situation trying to get the three comes away with nothing. Twelve play drive nothing to show. Holds fine he just pushed it to the right. It's a long kick. Plenty of distance. Yep. Pushed it to the right. BYU fans are just befuddled because Matt Payne had made 14 in a row from between 40 and 49 yards. And now he's missed his last four field goals, three from that distance. What a knockout punch time now for Smith. 
Instead, he is brought down as a penalty marker comes down. Back to the 20. Matt Bauman, who was invited to be one of the 105 to try out for this roster at the start of the year, face mask Smith. We've talked so much about what Utah is playing for here tonight. Again, BYU trying to avoid a third consecutive losing season that hasn't happened in 40 years. And if they were able to win, they would get to probably the Las Vegas Bowl. That AutoZone Liberty Bowl is usually for the champion here in the Mountain West to take on the champion of Conference USA. Obvious question becomes with Utah already having clinched the Mountain West, what would happen? If they go to the BCS, the Liberty Bowl contract does state they get the conference champion. Utah is the conference champion. We talk to the executive director of the Liberty Bowl momentarily. 15 yard flag, first and 10 from the 43. Marty Johnson gets it for five, and here's Jeff. I'm here with Steve Earhart, the executive director of the Liberty Bowl. Mike, as you said, now if Utah qualifies for a BCS Bowl, will you release them from their obligation as the Mountain West Conference champion of your game? Well, Joe, we've been there for the beginning for the Mountain West Conference. Utah was a great champion of the AutoZone Liberty Bowl last year. We want the best for them. So, in fact, we're working right now with the commissioner. We want the best for Utah. We've been trying to bang the door down on the BCS, and Utah's a very deserving team. Have negotiations began for a release if Utah qualifies? Well, we're working on it right now because we had promised Urban Mike and the team that will stay out of that until they would win it on the field. Looks like they're on their way now, so we'll hopefully have an announcement by the end of the game. All right, thanks a lot. Hope you get two good teams. Back to you, Mike. Thank you, Jill. The run there by Alex Smith is very close to first down yardage. The AutoZone Liberty Bowl will be seen on ESPN, and Louisville is the yep. other side, the champion of Conference USA, you know, like that. <laughs> Maybe they could slip Boise State in there and be like 446 to 445. Oh, you know, there's always yeah. one bowl game that when you yeah, say you want to pack a sandwich. That's the one I want to go to. the Liberty Bowl that you Pack your if Boise State plays Louisville, I will go down there myself, pay my way to go to the game. Go to the game because that's going to be a great offensive show. It'll be interesting to see what they do with the available teams that's true. Uh, to play. Likely Louisville is the Conference USA champion, but it's the right thing to do, especially in the last year of a contract, as the Liberty Bowl is with this lead. AutoZone Liberty Bowl, first down run for Smith. He takes it to the 42-yard line. Well, we have talked so much about what is at stake here tonight. The historical perspective cannot be overstated, guys. This is uh, something college football had talked about as a potential, but has not seen, and we're on our way to seeing the first team, not from a big league, go to the BCS. Looks like Cinderella found his slipper. He's going to the ball. Yeah, and they just, football. You know, they, they haven't played a dominant game tonight. Alex Smith has been okay, but if you've watched him from the beginning, we were here the opening night. They played Texas A&M all the way up to this point. They deserve the opportunity. Without any question, they deserve a chance to get into the BCS and show what they can do against one of the big boys. From the 41, it's in the hands of Paris Moore. Took it out to the 34. Picked up the seven. Fans want the personal foul flag and it doesn't come you know I, I don't mean it disrespectfully when I say a team from one of the big big conferences and small conferences uh, the six power conferences that are there in the BCS with the guaranteed spots and uh, when it was set up the Big East was much more of a power conference than it is now who knows what the future will hold it is not meant disrespectfully the budgets are bigger the stadiums sure. are bigger sure and everything is the teams are better yeah, they more tradition. More they got better bigger, athletes, better players, more, more depth, of them. More depth. Yeah, they got everything. More. Better facilities in a lot of cases. They're building a great facility here in Utah. Just opened an indoor practice facility here in the last few weeks. Marty Johnson up the middle. Takes it to the 22-yard line. What helped this school so much facility-wise was getting the Olympics here in 2002. Here are the highest rankings by team of the BCS conferences. Obviously, one, two, and three. So much conversation continues there. There's Oklahoma and Auburn won today. Michigan will be in representing the Big Ten. Florida State trailing by seven over on ESPN. Boston College at 21. They have to beat Syracuse on Saturday. And Paul Peterson, their quarterback, as Matt told you at halftime, hurt his hand. Peterson went to junior college here in Utah. Wasn't recruited by either BYU or Utah coming out of JC. Could end up playing Utah in one of the bowls. Still a lot of matchmaking to talk about. 
And Utah, Tom Ganther, two yards. Excuse me, game. Mike. Utah is one of those football teams that if you're going to a bowl, you don't want to play because they sound like you should beat them, and they're very, very good offensively. With time to get ready, Kirk, they would be a tough team to stop. But they don't have the name. Right. And all your alumni so will say, you, you got to be Utah. So in other words, you're saying you have nothing to gain. Absolutely. Zero. That's why nobody wants to play them in a bowl game not, not unless to, they have to. The other thing is you're right, the system that uh, you're going to prepare for uh, for three or four weeks. From the 20, here is Smith to the end zone. Touchdown. Steve Savoy. And let the party in Salt Lake commence. Third touchdown of the night. 17th total touchdown on the season for Savoy. An Urban Myers team that averages 45 a game has 45 now. His uncle John L. Smith coaches Michigan State. Last week they knocked off Wisconsin. Uncle John L. had a tough loss today. Best to feel good for his nephew tonight. Well, the Olympic Cauldron Park. Stands off to our right here, um, commemorating uh, not just that the great moment when the Olympic flame was lit here in Salt Lake City, but also each day of the Olympics is uh, commemorated as you come into Rice Eccles Stadium. Special when you see an Olympics, but because of the tie to the state and the people here, this is as good a night as Utah natives will ever have in this place. Over 40 for the ninth time in 11 games. They've won them all by at least two touchdowns, and they're up 24 here in the fourth quarter. BYU gave some, some great effort tonight on both sides, and I think they just eventually lost to a better team. Just couldn't stay with this Utah football team, but they did come to fight. Utah put so much pressure on you. Offenses and defense sooner or later you buckle. John Beck's first down pass is hauled in, taken out to the 31 yard line. Oh, well, we mentioned Alex Smith and uh, his uncle, John L. Smith. If you're wondering what, why didn't Alex go play for his uncle, who was one of the great passing offenses in college football, well, John L. told him, I don't think I'm going to be in Louisville. There's a chance to take a big jump as he did a couple of years ago at Michigan State. That was during the recruiting process, so Alex ended up coming out here, and then Ron McBride, the coach, was let go. And he ended up inheriting Urban Meyer, who was spinning his magic with this offensive bowling green. Nice catch between players, then dropped again by Dennis Pitta. The freshman's had three drops tonight. Jill? You know, Alex Smith called his uncle John L. Smith after um, asking him for help against that Wisconsin team. However, when John L. called him back after they beat Wisconsin, I talked to Alex. He's yet to call his uncle back. Uh, I asked Alex, what are you doing not calling him back after that? You need to say thank you. He said, you know what, Jill, if we win this game, then I'll call him back. <laughs> John L. and Michigan State took a tough one. Congratulations to Joe Paterno closing out uh, with a win today. Two wins in a row. Maybe want to call just to see if everything's okay yeah. after today. Todd Watkins along the sideline out to the 44 yard line. 45 21 our score here as uh, Utah rushes up against history. Remember Louisville went to the 91 Fiesta Bowl but there were a couple of teams who did not want to play in the bowl game that year so there's a slight asterisk to Louisville's appearance in the Fiesta Bowl. So we are not forgetting that when reminding you that this would be historic especially since the bowl championship series was set up. But you think of the big bowls since they've reached that level that the Fiesta has over the last 20 years or so. Combined with the sugar and the orange and the rose, and you go back to the cotton. And since we've gotten to six superpower conferences, never seen somebody from outside come in. And it will create such attention because people will wonder how they'll match up, who they'll match up with. As uh, 
a conversation that will go on for the next couple of weeks until we have the selections two weeks from tomorrow. Well, these folks are thinking Tempe. That's why you've seen thousands of sombreros tossed out. Looks coming. Beck is crushed. And to add insult to the pain, it's dropped by Austin Collar. Kyle Whittingham has thrown about six or seven or eight different types of blitzes here throughout the night that John Beck and more importantly his offensive line have had to deal with. Beck makes the throw. The offensive line gave him just enough time but the ball is dropped. You know if Beck, Brown, Watkins and Collie came back next year that'd be a pretty nice offensive football team although we know Collie is going off in his mission right. Yes. Third down. Thinking about lighting up again. Penalty markers. This play is stopped. No play here. And they'll remark it. Prior to the snap, ball star. Offense, number 65. Five yard penalty. Still third down. I mean, uh, as rivalry weeks happen, insults get traded. And it's funny, you see the same jokes about schools. They insert your school here over and over and over. How do you get an alum of school X off your doorstep if you're a fan of school Y you give them five dollars and say thanks for the pizza you know all those things and BYU alum sent an email joke to one of the local TV stations this morning about one thing that we have in, your, in our stadium that you don't have in Rice Echo Stadium that's a national championship battle BYU has had its moment on the big stage in 1984 corner blitz picked up but the rush gets back Back to the 38 yard line. Sione Boa. Ooh. He's had a terrific evening. Boa was in there, Rissa Williams, and also another corner blitz. If, if you're going to play Utah in a BCS bowl game, get ready for the corner blitz from the boundary. I mean, it's they've, they've run that about eight times tonight, and it's been very effective. Every time they've run it, they've gotten pressure on Beck. Now it's Smith will to come back out again. And it comes to punt by Payne. It will bounce harmlessly out of bounds at the 17 yard line. When we come back we'll talk to the man who has uh, made the Fiesta Bowl it's one of the great bowls in the country. John Junker will join us up here in the booth. 45 21 Utah. That is Shelly Meyer, Urban Meyer's wife, so instrumental in the decision as they left Bowling Green to come out here to Utah. Shelly and Urban were uh, out here as uh, part of the Colorado State staff with uh, a good man, Sonny Lubick, and it's one of the reasons that Urban ended up taking this job out here because Shelly and the family love their time out here on the West Coast. Uh, first down run gains about three yards and as mentioned we'll join here in the booth by John Junk executive director the man who's taken the Fiesta Bowl to uh, terrific heights obviously you didn't come for the weather although it's a very comfortable November night uh, <laughs> what would a team not from the BCS power conferences quote unquote mean to a bowl because obviously there's some trepidation but there are also great positives well obviously there's still football to be played in that final poll on the 5th of December but you have to take your hat off to Urban Meyer, his coaches and players, this whole community and university that made this happen. It's history making. Here's a uh, second down pass. Complete to Savoy. Takes it shy of the 30 yard line. Yeah, I mentioned you had the experience with Louisville in 91. You go back in the formative stages when you made the Fiesta Bowl into something. When a school gets the first taste of something like this, do you find that the excitement level is uh, just something that bubbles over Cinderella stories are something that all of America loves and that's been a part of our growth at the Fiesta Bowl from the time that nine community founders put our game together. Mm -hmm. We always talk about what bowls teams may go to and that the ACC or that the SEC is a tie in with the Sugar Bowl and the obvious Pac-10 Big Ten tie in with the Rose Bowl. People forget that you guys have a tie in with the Big 12. Absolutely. We're proud to be the partner of the Big 12 and they've had tremendous teams in the BCS and and we had the Big 12 champion Kansas State last year with that big upset victory in Kansas City. Timeout taken here by Smith. The assumption John is that if uh, if Utah wins tonight which they've done 
that the Fiesta Bowl will welcome Utah and all of their fans. Is it as simple as that, or does it still depend on what happens with Auburn and Oklahoma and USC and the Orange Bowl? We've learned, Kirk, this time of year to be very careful about those things, because one thing that we've learned is there's usually at least one more surprise in the BCS right. in the final weeks of play. So we want to be deferential to the process, to be very careful, but obviously we're here because Utah's had a great season, and and they're they're in the very top of the poll and 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 we should be here to have take serious consideration of what they offer. That's to be fun seeing the sombreros the Tostitos yeah, being thrown around. Obviously people have embraced the possibility and that's the excitement and the enthusiasm the fans bring and what they might bring to a Tostitos Fiesta Bowl if it all works out. Well John is always great to see you to the end of the uh, Best bowls, no matter BCS oh, or not BCS. It's a wonderful time out there. Yep. It's an honor to be here with all of you and uh, to represent our bowl. Well, I did. I did notice a guy from the Sugar Bowl here too, didn't you? Yeah, I did too. What did John? Was that guy here from the Sugar Bowl? Uh, they're here. They're a great bowl. It's a little, <laughs> little longer commute, though, from Salt Lake. <laughs> All right. Thank. Thank you, John. Yeah. Thank you, John. Great seeing you. you bet. John Junker. I go uh, play. Fiesta, Tostitos <laughs> Fiesta Bowl. That'll be a January 1st game. It happens uh, in prime time on ABC right after. The Rose Bowl. So third down after the timeout. Harris Warren on the edge picks up a first down out past the 30 yard line. These guys understand so there's still a lot of football to be played, and we've seen surprises on championship Saturday in three of the last four years. Plus, they don't trust each other either. Both guys. <laughs> I mean, it, it, we've seen more than once, haven't we? we they, oh yeah. You know, they show you one thing, but they're really thinking another. It's really going to depend on who ends up number two playing USC. That's if it's right. Auburn, the Sugar Bowl has that first pick, and they very easily could take Utah. Mm -hmm. If it's Oklahoma, then it's obviously going to be John Junker and the Tostitos Fiesta Bowl. First down toss. Goes right back to the man who picked up the last first down, Paris Warren. Takes it to the 42. There are so many issues, including yeah. the one of Urban Meyer. Will he be the Utah head coach next year on your uh, college game day show on ESPN Radio last night? Urban said the same thing he said on college game day on TV. You and Chris and Lee and everybody else. That, you know, he intends to be the. He said everything he has to, to say, say yeah. and supposed to say at this point, knowing that likely calls will come um, from interested schools as they do when you're 20 and 2 at a place. And if you're a football coach like Urban Meyer all of his life you want to go to the next level. Sure. This is not the top level in college football coaching. I'm just going to say that right yep. now. Yep. And if he gets a chance to go to a place like Florida which has wonderful facilities great crowds top five job, top five job in America. Quinton Ganther to the 45. My question First down would be if that starts to become a reality now that their regular season is over this is always a sticky issue let's say Florida does come in yeah. and um, by Monday they make the phone call and they start to talk and all of a sudden the ball starts moving off Florida needs to hire a coach they need to start to recruit let's say they let's just for argument's sake say they all, they hire Urban Meyer does he coach in this BCS Bowl this year for Utah the way Mike Price did with Washington State a few years ago in the Rose Bowl before he went to Alabama or does he leave and go to the the new job if he gets hired. First and 10 from the 45 kept by Alex Smith who gets five the ball came out and it's recovered. I, I just don't know Utah. if there's a right answer. It, well I think the I hardest do. situation ever with that as you look at Meyer Jeff Tedford uh, Dan Hawkins at Boise Bobby Petrino by the way all offensive coaches and some of the top scoring yeah. teams that's why they are extraordinarily attractive in addition to the obvious if I was Urban Meyer and I was offered the Florida job I'd go to my next job and I'd have these Utah people take one of my staff members and I'd coach let them coach the football team against the opponent that they have yeah because it's so hard to prepare you can't. for a BCS poll game and then you're on the phone they're, they're, they're calling they're recruits, recruits for oh, Florida you you're overhearing your own you, you can't do both jobs I got one more point to make about that one after this play they're going to throw an option throw from Ganther downfield and incomplete intended for Steve Savoy I will never ever ever forget when Bobby Bowden let Mark Rick coach the offense against your Oklahoma team in the Orange Bowl and they got beat 13 to 2 and I said then and I'll say it now once a guy takes a job don't let the door hit you in the butt 
get out of here because you can't do two jobs. For those who have not been privy to all the little specifics, the last 25 days since October 25th, we've had seemingly endless internet reports and denials that Urban Meyer would be the next guy in Florida after Ron Zook was fired. The Florida president, Bernie Manchin, spent six years here uh -huh. as the president at Utah and hired Urban Meyer here. I, I just don't think it's as a slam dunk as everybody is making out to be. I still think Jeff Tedford at Cal is going to be in the mix in that discussion before it's all said and done. First down for Marty Johnson. Here's Matt Weiner in the studio. Now Mike Nick Saban's name is going to be bandied about. Could LSU lose a third conference game this year? Alabama already fell to three and five. Everybody else in that half of the SEC will be under 500 with Auburn, of course, on top. Let me give you another point when I, why I think Urban Meyer is a sensational choice for somebody. He's done it twice. Sure. Once in coaching, maybe is lucky. But he did it at B uh, Boston uh, Bowling, Bowling Green. Green. And then he came all the way over here and did it at Utah. That's why, in my opinion, he's a slam dunk, Kirk, because he's done it twice. Okay. Jeff Tedford, great football coach. Sure. He's done a wonderful job at Cal, but he's done it white once. Right. This guy's done it twice. Sir, I, I see, I, you're missing my point. I'm not okay. saying he's not a great no. coach and he shouldn't get the job. I'm just saying I don't think it's a slam dunk. He very easily could end up being the head coach of Florida. I'm just saying, I think some of these yeah. reports are premature. I still think Jeff Tedford's name should be out there and is a guy that they're going to want to talk to. Of course, Urban Meyer is a great coach, and any, anybody in the country would be very lucky to have him as their head coach. And they pick up the first down there Let's with get three and a half to go. Je Jeff Tedford, I think, will be a National Football League coach could before be. he's another college coach. At the 15 yard line, up 24. Utah just waiting for midnight on New Year's Eve and the ball to drop <laughs> as the ball drops there. Thank you, Alex, for helping me out there. His wife, Shelly, a great story for them. Now, on the other side, it's the complete opposite story. Gary Croton, who took over for the legendary Hall of Famer Lavelle Edwards at age 47, has seen a team that started 10 and 0 then lose to get to 12 and 2 go with three consecutive non winning seasons on top of that there were honor code violations every employee or student at BYU a school owned and operated by the Church of Latter Day Saints the Mormon Church everyone must adhere to an honor code and some freshman football players violated that honor code that brought public embarrassment to the school and uh, obviously the sponsoring church uh, it has come out that some while a police investigation has gone on to this incident that happened a week before the season got started a couple of nights before involving group sex with a 17 year old pornography and alcohol involved both violations of the honor code this is the second time a story of this like this broke in eight months there have been some people suspended from school two one is on probation another is waiting and still the investigation goes on with five of their players that on top of what's happened on the football field is why many people have been reporting that Gary Croton could be on a very short window Panther takes it inside the 10 down to the five Gary told us this week I feel the program is in a good position I feel we have players going in we lost a lot of people in the transition from the legendary Lavelle Edwards the mission Ideal to get arms grasped around that all those things. So there's a lot going on at BYU and I would say stay tuned over the next couple of days. Utah is going to get some big names out some opportunities for some players to get on the field. Urban is fired up over there on the sidelines. A moment many never thought they'd see. Ganther has 122 yards. I wonder if Alex Smith is going to get out here after taking a snap on first down. Don't need to really do much. So just hand it off. The basketball curtain calls. Are you asking for? Yeah, I, it, would, it would be great. Alex is a junior. There is potential of Alex not returning. They ran uh, the big man in there. Fafita. Steve Fafita came in to run a play. Now's a perfect time to take him out for let him have a standing yeah, ovation, yeah. right? He yeah. and Paris Warren. Utah, 534 total yards, 350 on the ground, 
Fafita in there looking for his William Refrigerator Perry moment as a D lineman scoring as a running back. Oh, oh Fafita big bounced it to the outside. Oh, you kidding me? <laughs> Tortillas fly. Ice douses the coach. The lineman scores a touchdown, and the rivals say, we'll remember this, and we'll get you back at some point down the line. Meanwhile, I say, that was 315 pounds dancing around defenders. <laughs> oh, my God. 52-21. Steve Fafita. Bouncing it to the outside. And they'll be bouncing all around Salt Lake City. A face full of ice on the way to the BCS. Time is presented by Pontiac and the first ever G6, the next official performance machine of the NCAA. And in part by... Not much you can add to this scene. Back this summer, the Utah folks were hearing newspapers around here, hey, chance to go undefeated if they beat Texas A&M in the first game. And Urban Meyer got really uptight with the players and said, none of that talk, guys. Pulled down, caught by a face mask. With one player who's lost a helmet, no face mask penalty, uh, face mask flag is down. The flag is down, a face mask penalty has been called. On with Grady Marshall. So as they assess this 15-yard penalty here in the final minute, let's go through our Seiko storyline. Utah will get to 11-0. BYU, three consecutive losing seasons. Smith threw a couple of picks, did a good job running. Warren, 100 total yards. So they'll assess the flag. BYU will take over just shy of the 40. The students move into position, hopefully for a safe celebration. Be right back. What do we mean when our Yamaha game track here tonight? Paul Nagahiva's safety has had a terrific game of corner. Excuse me. Five tackles, a fumble recovery for touchdown as well. Some big hits. Alex Smith, there's his total number. It's one running, one throwing. Urban Meyer in Utah. The way things have shook down, and number eight in the BCS standings is trailing as well. Florida State over on ESPN. Nobody's going to hop up there inside of them. In the last couple of minutes, it's been tears and smiles and students streaming down here in the, uh, the north side of the stadium. Final moments here for BYU. Beck throws incomplete. Penalty marker down. Think they're going to call roughing the passer. Obviously, given what happened in Detroit with just the awful display by Ron Artest violating every rule ever of being an athlete and going into the stands, and the reprehensible actions by the people in Detroit, the few fans who ruined it, and about 30 or 40 would be the number. Given that and what we saw in the Clemson, South Carolina game, we can only hope that the fans celebrate politely, they enjoy their moment, and the BYU players safely get off the field. It would be so silly to ruin a moment so special but we have seen very unintelligent display over the last 24 hours I see these guys faces I think about the 6 a.m. wake up calls for winter conditioning spring ball two a days all the work that you put in and how rewarding it is when you finish a year like this be careful let's go right into the student section ran over one of the security people there an incomplete intended for Rodney Wilkerson. And this is what's so good about college football, what we're seeing right now. Here's a football team, Utah, on the outside, that's finally going to get a chance to go into the inside. And this is what makes college football great. If you could only be here to yeah. see this scene of the student body circling the field, 
The looks on those players, players' face, that's 2,000 times better than that Clemson, South Carolina stuff that didn't represent college football at all. There's Shelly, Urban's it. wife. Yeah, what do you mean? It's talk, good. Talked him into, you know, we can come out to the West Coast. We had such a great time in Colorado Springs and Colorado State. Now you touched on the student Fort Collins, excuse okay. me, I'm sorry. I, I don't know if I've ever seen, I don't know if they took reps with this there. It's well organized. Yeah. Nobody's on the field. Everybody's staying off until the last second. Many said, and the Tulane president has been the most vocal about, that this system cannot work for the, quote, little guy, not in the big league. Fahu Tahi with the run. From the first down to the 35. Well, this, in fact, is proof that the system can work for one of the teams not in one of the big six leagues. And I'm interested to see now, since it was lack of interest in the fifth bowl by the television networks, if they can't come back and say, no, look, why change everything? Utah just proved if you're good enough to get in the top six, we don't need the fifth bowl. Mike, think about uh, it. Well, we need a fifth bowl. We just right. need it with a plus one for a national yeah, yeah, yeah. BCS. That's not going to happen because the presidents are not going to let it happen. Maybe one day they'll wait. To the 26 time. yard line, BYU <laughs> still running a little hurry up. They spotted the ball, but the fans swarmed the field. The game is over. The dream has been realized. Utah, you did see it in the BCS. that all the BYU players are making their way off without being hassled. The Utah fans are handling this in a terrific first class manner. The officials have made it off the field safely. The goal posts are being worked on on either side. I don't know if I've ever seen this many people on a field guys. This is an amazing sight. They've been waiting all year. They want to show America they deserve a shot. You know, now they're going to get it. You know what this reminds me of? The Boston Red Sox. Yeah. It also reminds me of a mosh pit at a concert. That's that's an unbelievable oh, scene. Sorry. Look at that. Somewhere Jill Arrington's down there with Alex Smith. Jill, if you can hear us, go ahead. Alex, congratulations with all the preseason expectations. Game after game, you guys got it done. Can you put it into words what this undefeated season means against your big rival, BYU? I can. This is a dream come true for this team. Uh, absolutely. That, that, that's what it is. And I'm so proud of this team and it, this family, you know, this coaching staff, this, this community that's kind of developed here. And, uh, you know, this team's worked so hard for this. And, uh, uh, you know, they, they, are, they deserve it. I, I can't say enough about my teammates and how, how much they mean to this and mean to me. It, it's incredible. And looking ahead, if you get to that big BCS Bowl game, you had a great performance today. Is there anything you can top it off with? Uh, I don't think so. This, this is it. This is all I wanted. Uh, you know, a chance, to, a chance to go to the BCS and play with the big boys. And then we're going to get our <laughs> shot, I think. So, uh, you know, all we could do was go 11-0, and that's all we could control, and we did that, so. Well, congratulations. You go celebrate with your team. Much deserved, Mike. Thank you, Jill. Congratulations, Alex Urban Meyer and all the people who put their heart and soul into the proudest moment in Utah football. They continue to work on both goalposts. The only thing that has not gone smoothly for Utah here tonight. Urban Meyer usually runs over to the student section. They've given him the sombrero. The goalpost comes down. Tonight the students have come to Urban Meyer and the Utes as the goalpost triumphantly is engulfed by the Utah students. In the city that has seen the Olympic flame and has seen Michael Jordan's memorable last shot in the finals and saw Magic beat Larry. Tonight you see Magic in college football. A night that the sport has never seen and will never forget. Let me remind you that Florida and Florida State is going on over on ESPN. A tight game at 10-3 still with Florida State trying to drive for a tying touchdown. Here, Federer Soften, a great tennis match comes up. The Masters come from Houston.
with Lee Corso, Kirk Herbstreit, Jill Arrington, the women and men of our ESPN team, Mike Tirico. Our privilege to be here on the night that Utah dances with the big guys, gets to the BCS. This has been a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. For more, log on to ESPN.com. Tennis next on ESPN2, Florida State, Florida on ESPN. Good night from Salt Lake.